Hello from Berlin. I am Katya. I cannot hear you. Hello, Dr. Katya. <laughs> Hello. Am, am I audible now? You are audible. Okay. Yeah, I'm Arijit. Katya. It's my colleague, Mr. Samarendra Kumar. Hi, Namaste. Hello, hello. Yeah. Namaste. Namaskar, Namaskar. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Matsudan Reddy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Namaskar and welcome. Yeah. I'm very excited about today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put on my lucky checkered coat. Wow. <laughs> um, I will put myself out uh, I just wanted to test if everything is working well yeah okay so, so I'll be back in about five minutes yeah yeah yeah, yeah that should be good. okay bye bye
Morning. It's possible. You can hear me, Katya? Okay. Good morning, Gemma. Yes. Good afternoon. Good morning. This is uh, Mansur Nedi from Embassy of India in Berlin. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yeah. Yes, you're audible. Yeah. So just let's wait for another couple of minutes. Uh, then we can start the meeting because we are expecting uh, uh, the ambassador also to arrive soon.
on the other. Oh, it's a good thing. Good waking. John V. Hello. It's not last year. This is uh, once again Matsutan Reddy from uh, Embassy of India in Berlin. Uh, I will just wait for another couple of minutes. Uh, ambassador is expected to arrive any moment, so we will start as soon as. Uh,
नमस्कार आई एम मधुसूदन रेड्डी काउंसलर साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी इंडिया इन बर्लिन I welcome you all uh, to this uh, virtual uh, meeting on uh, a symposium on Indo-German cooperation in research museum, and uh, I welcome you all to the Adhikarika Amrit Mahotsav, uh, which is an initiative of the government of India to celebrate and commemorate uh, 75 years of India's independence, the generosity of its people, culture, and achievements. Sir, uh, sir permission i will just take a minute to uh, explain about uh, i mean uh, to briefly introduce about a, a national council of science museum and live this uh, research museums uh, national council of science museums ncsm is the largest network of science and museums in the world and uh, nsm which is headquarters in kolkata has an so network of 25 science museums or centers spread across the country and a central research and training laboratory in kolkata Uh, as regards the Leibniz uh, Research uh, Museums, Leibniz Research Museum, there are eight research museums within the Leibniz Association that collect objects, conduct research, and transfer knowledge. Their archives contain well over 100 million objects and provide the basis for research into history of Earth and biodiversity, cultural history, and the history of technology, and for research into con uh, conversation of our scientific and cultural heritage. With these few uh, remarks, I would now request uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Parvatinini Harish, Ambassador of India to Germany. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador uh, Harish assumed charge as Ambassador of India to the Federal Republic of uh, Germany on November 6, 2021, last year. Previously, yeah. Ambassador Harish was Additional Secretary, Economic Relations in the Ministry of External Affairs. As Additional Secretary, Economic Relations, he led the Economic Diplomacy Division. that deals with bilateral economic relations of india with other countries he is an indian foreign service uh, officer of 1990 batch he learned arabic at the american university of cairo and passed the examination with distinction he has previously yes. served in the indian missions in cairo and riyadh and headed the post as india's representative to the palestinian authority stationed in gaza city he, he previously worked at east asia and external publicity divisions in the ministry of uh, external affairs and government of india for five mm -hmm. years from 2007 ambassador harish was the joint secretary and officer on special duty to the honorable vice president of india he has mm -hmm. he was previously consul general of india in houston usa and mm -hmm. ambassador of india to the socialist republic of vietnam from april 2019 to june 2019 Ambassador mm -hmm. Harish is a gold medalist mechanical engineering graduate from Usmania University College of Engineering in Hyderabad and he has studied at the Indian Institute of Management Calcutta with this uh, few words i would now request uh, ambassador harish to give his opening remarks guten tag uh, namaskar i want to welcome all of you uh, for uh, today's symposium on indo german uh, cooperation in research museums at the outset i want to express uh, my uh, gratitude to both partners uh, in this endeavor the uh, the national council of uh, uh, science museums and uh, uh, the leibniz uh, uh, research museums we have had a very very fruitful cooperation in this regard so far i want to specially thank uh, dr vashni uh, and his team at uh, the department of uh, science and technology uh, in the international cooperation division who have uh, been diligently following up further cooperation initiatives uh, between our two countries uh, ladies and gentlemen who are participating today um, let me tell you the importance of science museums i think more than any other initiative it is the science museums that are uh, truly responsible for igniting the scientific temper among common people especially among children and youth in our countries uh, germany has had a glorious tradition of science museums and uh, have really taken a lot of uh, uh, steps in popularizing science through their network of science museums in india too the national council of science museums have taken very interesting initiatives in this regard and uh, we now have an impressive array of science museums in the country and uh, also emerged as a significant uh, uh, consultancy for other developing countries who wish to initiate science museums in their own countries 
Um, we have also uh, been developing the necessary capabilities and competencies in this regard and making available the same to other developing country partners as part of uh, India's development cooperation outreach to other countries in the developing world. Um, one aspect, of, I have been here only three months, but one aspect of uh, um, uh, the science museums that I see is a close cooperation between uh, uh, the museums and the industry. Uh, there, there are a number of uh, museums that are specific to industries and uh, in this regard, I think uh, we could perhaps learn a lesson or two from the German example. Uh, let me take an example of the automobile industry, which is particularly strong in Germany. Uh, every major automobile manufacturer has uh, created uh, their uh, specific uh, museums, uh, which have become great uh, attractions in places like uh, uh, Stuttgart and Munich, and annually attract uh, thousands of uh, automobile enthusiasts and even common people who look at the research of automobile uh, uh, production uh, since inception and the new advances that have been incorporated in this particular sector. Uh, and they have also become great revenue generators in terms of tourist footfalls and a great interest worldwide uh, that these automobile museums have generated. So applied sciences is one area which has huge potential for science museums going forward. And I think keeping in view the rich history of various crafts and arts and also particularly industries in India, um, I think there is a strong case for probably following up on the German example, collaborating with industry and creating a, a, a sector specific uh, applied science uh, museums, uh, which not only have uh, a great tourist interest and interest for the common person, but uh, are also able to ignite a whole new interest in science. I think these could be uh, a way forward and uh, I would like to request uh, the distinguished uh, audience and gathering uh, here today to see what are those areas where we could probably uh, benefit and participate uh, in collaboration with our uh, German friends and colleagues. Um, uh, I don't want to take much of your time. I again want to thank you for your participation. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Reddy for bringing this group together uh, and both the Indian and German partners for their enthusiasm. Science and technology is a very important area for our cooperation. We have over 35,000 Indian students here who are studying many of them in STEM disciplines in Germany. Germany is increasingly becoming a great uh, source of attraction for uh, higher education for Indian students uh, uh, in comparison to their traditional destinations. And I'm sure this trend will strengthen forward. This is a great source of interest for both of our industries. They are looking to collaborate closely with the research institutions and universities. So more power to your efforts and to your initiative. I want to thank you for your participation and for the organizers for having brought such a, a great gathering today. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, kind remarks. Uh, we will just go. Dr. Vashne will be joining a little late. Uh, uh, so we will have uh, Professor Alexander Bush, Leipzig's uh, Research Institute for Archaeology and Mines. So Professor uh, Bush is the Director General of the Romanish Germanish uh, Central Museum in Mines and University Professor in Classical Archaeology at the Jonas Johannes uh, Gutenberg University. Her research area is Roman archaeology with uh, specializations in cultural and social practice, settlement archaeology, cultures of memory, materiality, and the Roman military history. Uh, I mean, uh, Professor uh, Bush has edited numerous volumes on Roman archaeology in German and Italian and is the author of dozens of uh, journal articles and exhibition catalog contributions. She has been a corresponding member of the German Archaeological Institute since 2013. I would now request uh, Professor Bush to deliver her talk. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, Your Excellency, Ambassador Harish, um, Dr. Varshney, dear colleagues, our best wishes to you and India as a whole on the 75th anniversary of independence. On behalf of the Leibniz Association and the Leibniz Research Museums, I'm honored to take part in the Alexia of Freedom festivities during this week of celebration. As chair of the Leibniz Alliance Research Museums, I'm very pleased that the important work and role of research museums are part of the program of the festivities, because I think that museums can make a change and that strong international networks are a key to that. Museums worldwide are encountering new societal 
and global challenges that call for us to rethink our role as research museums and to assume responsibility differently than before. Participation and education are key factors to face these challenges. Knowledge needs to be accessible and understandable, and we as museums need to create inclusive spaces and programs. And as we all encounter the same challenges, we want to connect to learn from each other, as we already did in our fruitful cooperations with your museums, and we want to grow together with you. And please allow me um, to tell you a bit about the Leibniz Research Museums, our work together over the last few years. That was very important to, to also get closer together, um, despite the disciplinary boundaries that we have in our museums. And, um, and I would also like to say something about what we plan for the years to come. The Leibniz Research Museums are aiming to strengthen both inter- and transdisciplinary research approaches in the cultural and natural sciences, as well as technology, particularly excellent collection-based collection research. Um, they actualize the potential of unique scientific collections to tackle major challenges facing society. The Leibniz Research Museums want to foster dialogue-rich science communication on major societal and global challenges of our time, as well as the future of a democratic knowledge-based society. We are proactive in taking on social responsibility, communi communicating new research findings, and at the same time establishing an understanding of the processes of scientific discovery among a broad general public. We aim to incorporate public questions and suggestions into research and hope to create an enduring willingness to consider science within social and political debates. The Leibniz Research Museums are developing digital solutions, placing a high priority on digitizing our extensive collections guided by the future needs of all relevant stakeholders in research, science communication and knowledge transfer. Our museums are developing methods for the digital capture of research objects and the creation of sustainable structures for storing and providing access to digitized material. The Leibniz Research Museums are building an alliance of institutions with a distinctive profile and close collaborative relationships. Our eight museums, from the um, science to the humanities, are strengthening the integrated research museum and are intensifying our collaborations, especially in the areas of collection, transfer and international partnerships. As an alliance, our museums are systematically pursuing a joint mission. All of what I just said cannot be done alone. Collaborations, cooperations and international networks are crucial. Therefore, we do not only want to connect and exchange experience, but we want to face our challenges together. My museum director colleagues, Clement Tockner, Bernhard Misov and Helmut Rischler will be speaking about their institutions and the extensive and fruitful collaborations with Indian researchers and partners. For my part, I look forward to continuing and expanding our work with one another, with the National Council of Science Museums in particular, over the next years. Many thanks and best wishes in the celebratory time for India. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bush, uh, for your excellent uh, words. I would now request uh, 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 Dr. E.D. Choudhury, Director General, uh, National Council of uh, Science Museums in Kolkata. So just a couple of words about uh, Professor uh, Dr. E.D. Choudhury. He is a mechanical engineer by education. He is a science museum professional and has served in several science museums and centers under the NCSM across India. He is currently the Director General of National Council of Science Museums, which is an autonomous body under the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. Uh, Dr. Choudhury has contributed immensely to the development of uh, new methods of engagement through electromechanical techniques and digital technologies. 
He was appointed as DG NCSM in March 2019 and is now primarily involved in developing new science centers across the country under the Ministry of Culture scheme for promotion of culture of science. He also holds the additional charge of director Indian Museum Kolkata since uh, September 2019. He's a member of many state science and technology councils, science communication organizations and science museum centers and governing bodies. With these uh, few words, I would now request uh, uh, Dr. Choudhury to give his opening remarks. Dr. Choudhury, please. I'll be sharing a PowerPoint presentation and can share this. Can give me the start. Yeah, I, I'd request the to uh, give me access to share the PowerPoint presentation. His Excellency, the Ambassador of India to Germany, Dr. Harish Ji, Dr. Vashne, Head uh, International Corporation uh, Division of the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, Dr. Alexander Bush, dignitaries from both Germany and India, and my colleagues from different science centers across India from the Council. To start with, you know, I personally feel it's very important that to tell a little bit about my organization. Uh, when NCSM started, in fact, uh, the first science museum, it's called the Birla Industrial and Technological Museum, that started in 1959. A bit history about that. The Honorable Chief Minister of West Bengal, then Dr. Bidhan Chandra Ray, he visited the Deutsches Museum in, in Munich. And that is where, you know, he was inspired to see the way science and technology is communicated to the common people. And after coming back to India, he approached the government of India for setting up similar facilities in our country. And with that, in 1959, on the 2nd of May, Birla Industrial and Technological Museum was created under the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. So with the success of Birla Industrial and Technological Museum in reaching out to the people through hands-on exhibits, through collection of antiquities, uh, the BITM was requested by a trust in Bangalore called the Visheshwaraya Trust for setting up a new science museum there called the Visheshwaraya Industrial Technological Museum. And Visheshwaraya Industrial and Technological Museum was set up in 1965 by a team which went from BITM to set up this facility. My colleague director from BITM uh, Bangalore is here today and she'll be sharing her experience about BITM. Subsequently, CSIR started work for setting up a science center in Bombay, now Mumbai. But it was unlike the Science and Technology Museum, it was more in the form of a science center, similar to the concept of the Exploratorium, which was started by Frank Oppenheimer in San Francisco. Seeing the success of both the Science and Technology Museums and the commencement of work for setting up of a new science center in um, Bombay then, a task force was set up by the Planning Commission of the Government of India in 1973. And the task commission rec recommended that science museums should be set up across the country. And they also recommended formation of a separate body for this activity. So in 1978, the Government of India delinked BITM and VITM, that is Birla Industrial and Technological Museum, and Visheshwaraya Industrial and Technological Museum, as well as the upcoming Science Center at Bombay, now Mumbai, and put them under the newly formed autonomous body in the name of National Council of Science Museums. So when NCSM was formed, we had two science and technology museums in Kolkata and Bangalore. And the third was coming up then at Mumbai, which was subsequently named as the Nehru Science Center Mumbai. We have the director of Nehru Science Center Mumbai also, who has joined in this program, and he'll be also sharing his experience uh, about the various facilities and infrastructure that we have created there. 
among many objectives of NCSM, one major objective is to collect, restore, and preserve important historical objects and artifacts, which represent landmarks in the development of science, technology, and industry. It is also our responsibility to preserve and keep this art artifacts and antiquities for posterity and for the benefit of the population in the years to come. VITM and VITM in Bangalore both have large collection of antiquities and it is the time to time they curate special exhibitions on specific themes for bringing those collections to the visitors. After the formation of the Nehru Science Center in Mumbai, there was a rapid expansion of Science Center movement in India. And today we have 25 science centers across the country, which are operated by the National Council of Science Museums. This also includes the Central Research and Training Lab. This includes also the Central Research and Training Lab, which is the R&D Center for all R&D activities of the Council. We have, as the Honorable Ambassador has just mentioned, NCSM is also the implementing agency for the scheme for promotion of culture of science of the Ministry of Culture. Under this scheme, we have already set up 22 science centers across the country, and many more are in the making. In fact, 12 of them are being uh, developed now. We have another 12 more, which is in the stage of approval and probably in another six to eight months, we'll commence work for at least another five to six new science centers across this country. Now, one, while, while one part of this is setting up science centers, considering the population that we have and a huge youth population of the country, it is extremely difficult to come up with a large number of science centers in a very rapid manner. So NCSM also started a mobile science exhibition, basically to take science to the rural doorsteps. Today we operate 48 mobile science buses across India and they cover the rural areas, the rural hinterland to take the message of science. And we also arrange a lot of demonstrations, a lot of film shows, a lot of uh, special programs. We have a portable planetarium. We also carry telescopes. We have uh, special demonstrations for these children. And in this process, we are trying to nurture the young population and encourage them to take science as a career. When uh, two of my colleagues had been to Germany for a meeting with Leibniz a couple of years back, and we thought that this would be a wonderful opportunity if we can continue our collaboration with the Leibniz Association. Uh, NCSM has a very large number of scientific and industrial artifacts in its collection, which is spread across mainly the major big science, science, science centers that we have in Bangalore, Delhi, Kolkata, and Mumbai. And we have also made efforts to collect industrial relics by all of our science centers. So this is a continuous process. As and when opportunity arises, we are collecting these relics for preserving our uh, history. Moreover, more research into such collection needs to be done by younger professionals joining the science center movement in our country. So we feel it will be a wonderful opportunity if NCSM can collaborate with the Science and Technology Museum under the Leibniz Association in exchange of experts for workshops in NCSM units for conservation and preservation of such scientific and industrial artifacts, as well as to discuss ways how these objects can be taken forward through proper research and publication. I think this will be a wonderful opportunity if this association between two great institutions continue in the years to come and we can take forward this joint collaboration for the benefit of our collections also. NCSM and Leibniz may kindly 
explored the possibility to hold curated science and technology exhibitions also on the history of science and technology in both the countries. We can consider having exhibitions both in our country as well as in Germany in the form of traveling exhibitions with our artifacts. And that will be an opportunity to take our collections to different segments of people across the world. Thank you so much with this introductory remarks. I look forward to a wonderful association between these two great institutions in the years to come. Thank you, Namaskar. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, for uh, your opening remarks and uh, for uh, coming up with proposals uh, which, uh, uh, between NCSM and LAGMIS. Thank you very much. We'll uh, continue our discussions. Now, uh, I, I heard that uh, Professor Tokman uh, uh, will be leaving soon for another meeting. So I would now request Professor Clement Tokman, who is the Director General of uh, Director General of uh, Sinkenberg Society for Nature Research to speak. Uh, he, uh, his, uh, he, uh, Professor Doctor uh, was the president, previous president of Austrian Science Fund from 2016 to 2020. He's a full professor for aquatic ecology at the Free University of Berlin from 2007 to 2020 and director of the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries in Berlin. His research interests focus on dynamics, biodiversity, and sustainable management of water bodies, particularly at the interface of different disciplines such as ecology, geomorphology, and hydrology. His over 250 publications combine basic research with application-oriented study and link natural and social science topics. He's a member of the prestigious Austrian Academy of Sciences and the prestigious German Academy of Sciences Leopoldina. I request Professor Topner to, uh, to speak. Thank you very much. The Ambassador, Your Excellency Harish, dear Dr. Vashne, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be invited to the ceremony of the occasion of the 75th anniversary of Indian independence. India is not only the greatest and largest democracy on earth, it is also a hotspot of global hotspot of biodiversity and a highly trustful partner in science and innovation. I follow my colleague Professor Bush as the second representative of the Leibniz Research Museums. I'm the Director General of Senckenberg Society of Nature Research, an institution that includes three museums at the locations of Frankfurt, Görlitz, and Dresden. These are 42 million objects. We are the largest natural history collection in Germany and among the largest globally. Senckenberg has a 200-year-long tradition of research and in civic engagement. More than 800 people from 40 nations work at the seven institutes of Senckenberg and more than 1 million people visit our museums each year. We at Senckenberg, we explore nature in the earth system context using an integrative geobiodiversity approach. Our scientists study the diversity of life. That means biodiversity, including the manifold interactions between the biospheres with other spheres of our planet. Most important, however, is to understand the complex interactions between people and nature and how to create a safe and just corridor for our planet. Senckenberg sees its role as that of an honest broker. We provide the information and knowledge required for developing evidence-based solutions. More than ever, we need concerted actions at the local to the global scale in order to cope with the immense challenges humankind is facing. Science is based on, the, on international collaboration and on trust. Senckenberg has a number of long-term, fruitful and mutual collaborations with Indian researchers and research institutions. Two outstanding examples will be presented later on during these events. Event. This includes the discovery of a new species, the so-called golem fish, the dynamics of the monsoon systems in the Holocene, the DNA analysis of the Indian giant softshell turtles, and much more. Senckenberg is also very active in capacity building. For example, an international course on collection management is offered at the University of Dresden, in which Indian students are also enrolled. Also, our collections are frequently visited by our Indian scientific colleagues for their collection-based research. Oh, yeah. 
Our scientists are very fortunate to collaborate successfully with the highly competent and enthusiastic colleagues from India. Consequently, we are looking forward to further strengthen the mutual collaboration between research institutions and natural history museums of India and Senckenberg. Breakthroughs in science and innovation are only possible through international networks and through sharing data, information and knowledge openly. Now I wish all guests an inspiring meeting and a wonderful celebration. Thank you so much. Chair, Professor Tukna, for your uh, kind words. And uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Esti, head uh, International Cooperation Division, who has just uh, uh, to give his uh, remarks. Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Vashne is the advisor and head of International Cooperation Division at the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. Uh, he has previously worked as counselor uh, uh, at the Embassy of India in Moscow to facilitate bilateral scientific cooperation between India and Russia. Presently, he is working, as I said, as advisor and head of international division, where he is responsible for facilitating bilateral, multilateral, and regional uh, scientific cooperation of India with partner countries. He is Indian co-chair, governing body, uh, uh, governing body of the Indo-German Science and Technology Center. He is a member in board of directors of Global Innovation and Technology Alliance. He is a member of governing councils of uh, Indo-US Endowment Fund, International Advanced Research Center for uh, Powder Metallurgy in Hyderabad and uh, US India Education Foundation. He's also a member of Board of Research Studies in Department of Geology, Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, he's a life fellow of uh, Geological Society of India, Bangalore, and Nepal Geological uh, Society. Uh, with this uh, few remarks, I would now request uh, Dr. Vashni to give his uh, opening. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you, Madhu. Uh, I think uh, museum plays a very, very important role in the education of science. What textbook probably can't teach, museum can do. And that is why uh, both India and Germany realize the importance of science museum. And I'm so very happy that today, although we are celebrating Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, festival of our independence, 75th year, uh, but we have clubbed it with some business. And that business is that to bring together the museum community of two countries together where we could exchange ideas and if possible take a lead to work together in future and of course i come from department of science and technology where we are having a lot of indo-german scientific activities i would be too delighted if we could put one more color on the can uh, canvas and collaborations between uh, our National Council for Science Museum and Libes uh, Group Research Museum would is very, very timely. And we should come forward with some specific idea. I hope today's meeting would help us know each other much better to know what are the strengths of each group and how we could capitalize on those strengths to make a wind in partnership between Indian and German research museums. So I'm looking forward very excitedly for this deliberations. And I do hope uh, that this meeting will not end today and will lead to a series of discussion in time to come. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for your kind remarks. Uh, now we will go as per the order uh, to the 32 order which had circulated. Now uh, we have uh, Shri uh, Samarendra Kumar, who is the director uh, at Gotos at NCSM, uh, would be speaking now. Uh, uh, Dr. Kumar is presently working, as I said, director at headquarters at NCSM in Kolkata. He has more than 32 years of experience in the field of uh, science communication. He has joined as curator at uh, Nehru Science Center in Mumbai in 1989 and has worked as project coordinator of Kurukshetra Panorama and Science Center Kurukshetra and Regional Science City in Lucknow in Uttar Pradesh before shifting to Kolkata. Uh, he is involved in setting up of innovation hubs in the country, implementation of uh, implementation of the scheme of promotion of culture of science of Ministry of Culture and Government of India. He is also involved in development of many galleries and exhibitions for various organizations and centers. Recently, he was instrumental in the international traveling exhibitions 
which is called superbugs the end of antibiotics in collaboration with uh, smg london and now working on another international exhibition hunt for the vaccines in collaboration with science museum london he has participated and presented several papers in uh, national and international conferences with this uh, small uh, introduction i would now request uh, uh, mr samarindra kumar to deliver his talk thank you yeah his excellency mr harish uh... Uh, the ambassador of uh, India and Germany, uh, esteemed uh, uh, presenters in this uh, symposium, uh, on behalf of National Council of Scientism, uh, it's my pleasure, to, uh, it's my privilege to be part of this symposium. Uh, in fact, uh, in uh, 1995, when this uh, uh, MOU was signed between NCSM and India, uh, I was uh, 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 witness to that. And in 2017, I, uh, I had the privilege to visit uh, Lebanese Association and two of the museums, the Duchess Museums in Munich and uh, the Museum for Narkunde in the Berlin. And it was really ex very exciting for me to see the collections and how they present. And uh, we, want, we, we wanted to take forward that initiative forward. And when we came back and uh, then we started, we had discussion on that. Unfortunately, because of this COVID, uh, there was no exchange of uh, professionals, but hope that in coming years, uh, this exchange of professionals will continue. Uh, uh, so, in fact, what we have done that uh, NCSM has been doing a plenty of number of activities throughout the year, and I would like to share uh, one of the uh, impact assessment study of the NCSM, which was conducted, uh, uh, which was commissioned by uh, NCSM in uh, 2016, and we had uh, a report was published in 2020. Because whatever we do, because India is a vast and diverse country with a strong affinity for science, technology, and a glorious past of science, technology, and innovation. And the rate at which the technologies are created and science is progressing is uh, are unmatched in the human history. Uh, so what science museums do is uh, they play the intermediate role of knowledge diffuser in the society by providing experiential non-formal educations to students, communities, and the general public. As a part of this uh, 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 science center uh, museum objectives, we, we have to conduct a number of activities, which includes uh, a number of uh, kind of things like science fairs, science expos, lectures, seminars, traveling exhibitions, mobile science exhibitions, workshops, community programs, and various other things throughout the year. In fact, uh, expositions of, uh, on contemporary uh, topics of science and technology and also the cutting edge science is very important and that has been being practiced in almost all the science centers in NCSM. Uh, but to just to find out what is the impact of Science Center, we conduct we just did an um, uh, impact assessment study in 2020, which the report was published, and we we found that it has a very encouraging result. Uh, in fact, uh, the study included feedback from about 15,865 stakeholders, uh, which included focus group discussions, visitors interviews across 22 science centers in India, and the stakeholders across uh, interview with. Uh, several policy makers, politicians, and government stakeholders. Uh, the, in fact, the basic, uh, uh, four major impacts were uh, tried to be studied, which included the personal impact, the, uh, the social impact, the political impact, and the economic impact. I'd like to share that. Uh, in the study showcase that 75% uh, of respondents mentioned that the programs that they attended during their visits were beneficial to them. So the science museum, the science centers in India have a very positive role to play in communicating, in communicating science and scientific topics to the young public, especially, and or to the masses in general. And 65% of visitors mentioned to relate the science experiments exhibits to their routine life. So basically it is connecting with their day-to-day -day activities also. And uh, we will get to know that 25% of respondents mentioned that the visit has helped rationalize their thinking while 20% believe that it had helped to reduce their superstitions. So these are some of the important uh, objectives which NCSM has tried to fulfill. In, in terms of the social impact which it has been created, that the 58% of the respondent agreed that science centers had possibly, positively impacted the community laser activities and also felt that science centers could create an impact on developing community partnership programs. 60% uh, of the respondent agreed that science centers have created or could create youth employment by providing knowledge, encouraging developing new technologies, and by increasing job opportunities. Another 86% of visitors believes museum science centers have created an impact on the formal education system 
in a positive way, such as by providing practical understanding in the subjects topics in a better way and by making the students more inquisitive. This ability to conduct experiments in a controlled setting has quoted uh, as one of the most significant learning from a visit to a science interest by stakeholders in, in, the, in the NCSM units. In terms of economic impact, I would like to say that 47% uh, of the tourists come to the city either by vis to visit the science center or at science center on the multi uh, visit list during the travel. While 29% believe that science center had improved the branding of the city. This indicates the importance of the science centers and the museums in the local tourism industry. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, major aspects is that uh, when the land parcel was given to uh, NCSM to set up a science city or a science center, it is uh, in general it is an ignored piece of land. But now it has earned that high profile accommodation is schools and universities, hotels, eateries, bus stops have been developed around the centers. In terms of political impact, uh, we feel that the 10% of the stakeholders agree that science centers create political impact. And discussions with the politicians highlighted that inter indirect role played by the science centers in political discourse through reducing superstitions, imparting new learning, and making people scientific thinkers. 5% of the visitors agreed that science centers could increase the influence of science in policy making in political discourse. Our experience in NCSM is that there is a huge demand for new science centers across the country and being initiated by local political uh, leaders. It is further established by the fact that number of questions are raised in both houses of parliament on science centers. So we feel that the science centers and the science museum in the country have a very positive role to play and the interaction between the two uh, big organizations like uh, Lebanese Association and NCSM will further help in uh, expanding the reach uh, both in terms of the research in the uh, uh, collections which we have and also the presentation of the scientific um, uh, latest SNT topics to the public in general and especially the children of the youth of the country. Uh, we, I, on behalf of organization, wish you all uh, very best for this 75th years of celebration of the India's independence and hope that this uh, collaboration between the two institutions will grow further and uh, will continue in future also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kumar, uh, for your uh, remarks. Uh, now uh, we have uh, next Professor Helmut Trischler. Uh, he, he's the head of research at Dushet Museum Munich, and he's a full professor of modern history and the history of technology at uh, LMU Munich, and the director jointly with Professor uh, Christoph Misch at the Rachel Carson Center. Uh, Professor Trischler's main research interests are knowledge societies and innovation cultures, international comparison. Uh, te science, technology, and European integration, transport history, and environmental history. Professor uh, Helmut Trischler is the author of 28 books and edited volumes, some 130 articles, and co editor of a number of book series. Uh, with these remarks, I would now request Professor Trischler to share his uh, views. Professor Trischler, please. His Excellency, dear colleagues, um, it's my great pleasure to contribute to this important event celebrating the 25th anniversary of Indian independence. Uh, and Mr. Chudri was already so kind to mention the formative role of Deutsches Museum in uh, yeah, creating, spurring, initiating the creation of the very first um, Museum of Science and Technology in India in 1959, when a delegation of Indian scientists visited Munich, the Deutsches Museum, and got, uh, got ideas what to do uh, in India. And from that yeah, uh, initiating moment in 1959 onwards, there has been a continuous exchange of people, of ideas between India and uh, Deutsches Museum's uh, uh, science centers and science museums. But we think there is even room for improvement in international collaboration and cross-national collaboration. I, I, I should say I do, um, I'm a, I'm a true believer in the importance of uh, collaboration. I think collaboration is the lifeblood of us as scientists, uh, both scientists and museums. Uh, collaboration is important on, on the very level of uh, individuals that collaborate, of institutions that collaborate, of um, disciplines that collaborate, but particularly in, uh, collaboration that cross borders, international collaborations. 
and um, I'm also a believer in the you know in the principle that often big things start small and then continue and uh, continue to to grow. Let me give one of those examples of small things that you know expand and then become bigger things, and that is a collaboration that was initiated actually, or that uh, used a program that we have at the Deutsche Museum called. Scholar in Residence program. So what we do is to invite people from uh, from abroad, from all over the globe, to come to the Deutsche Museum and re do research by using our resources, particularly our collections, of course, collection-based uh, research. And one of those researchers uh, was uh, two decades ago, Jean Bufalki, now founding director of the Science Gallery at Bengaluru. Who came to the Deutsche Museum to research a specific object uh, of Indian or let's say of international origins, the so called Marut, that's a uh, supersonic uh, airplane uh, built, created by Hindustia, Hindustan uh, Aeronautics um, Limited in the 50s and 60s, and uh, which is a, it is a truly global object. It was initiated by a German engineer, uh, but built in India using resources from all over the, over the globe. So there, here we had a, a cross uh, a national collaboration between an Indian scholar trained in Great Britain and uh, uh, making a brilliant, a brilliant career at uh, British uh, universities, but then returning uh, to India to build up, create these new facilities at, at Bengaluru. That provided then, you know, ideas for further collaboration between the new uh, science gallery and Deutsches Museum and Leibniz uh, Association, spurring lots of um, ind individual and institutional collaboration. And let me just mention one, uh, one upcoming big event that was spurred by this small, you know, uh, little, if you wish, uh, collaboration between two individuals, and that's the upcoming global summit of research museums the second one that we will be having at the deutsches museum later this year in october october 17 to 19 when the leibniz association's research museum will invite um, about 200 to 300 directors of museums all over the world and um, shanvi and myself will be you know um, conducting and organizing two parts uh, of this uh, three days long uh, event and collaboration, focus, focusing on the migration of objects, on the travel of knowledge that comes with objects, but also on the important questions of provenance research and yeah, restitution of objects between global south and global north, truly important issues that we have on the table that uh, resulted from our long and fragmented history of, yeah, sometimes also, you know, disconnections uh, during the um, Cold War. But more important is this, you know, reju continuous rejuvenization of collaboration. And um, having said this, uh, we would like to even further invite you or, you know, to reiterate our invitation to the Global Summit of Research Museums in October. Please collaborate as strongly as possible to again initiate or provide a room uh, for uh, improvement of cross-national, of truly global collaboration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Trishler, uh, for your uh, invitation to Indian colleagues uh, uh, for the forthcoming event. Uh, thank you very much for your opening remarks and other uh, proposals, which I am sure that uh, National Council for Science Museum uh, would uh, uh, accordingly uh, respond during uh, the subsequent discussions. Now I will uh, request uh, uh, Mr. Subhavrata Chaudhary, uh, who is a director of Nehru Science Center in Mumbai. Uh, Mr. Chaudhary is a postgraduate in engineering, business management and science communication and joined the council in 1997 uh, 1977. He worked as a curator in Science City Central Research and Training Laboratory, the R&D and HR wing of uh, NCSM, uh, Birla Industrial and Technological Museum, getting involved in a number of projects like Rajiv Gandhi Science Center in, uh, in Port Louis in Mauritius, 
setting up of science centers and innovation hubs in the northeastern region of the country, National Agriculture Science Museum of Indian Council of Agriculture Research, to name a few. He took over as director of Central Research and Training Laboratory in the year 2010 and executed a number of nationally and internationally important projects like Festival of uh, India exhibition in Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Malaysia, and Indonesia, regional science centers at Ranchi and Draipo, and setting up of uh, sub regional science centers in Johar and Itanagar, curation and implementation of the Buddha Gallery at the International Buddhist Museum in Kandy, Sri Lanka, on behalf of Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, Sri Chaudhary is also responsible for implementation of new display and communication techniques for exhibits of diverse nature during his career. He was also the director of Science City Kolkata from April 2018 to June 2021. He's, as I said, is currently the director of Nehru Science Center Mumbai uh, from July 2021. Mr. Kumar, please. Chaudhary, please. Thank you. Uh, very good morning to my German friends and very good afternoon to those from India. Uh, His Excellency, Ambassador of India. And it is a great privilege to be the part of this discussion. I am from Nehru Science Center. Actually, it was formally dedicated to the nation in the year 1985 by the then Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi. But this center was a trendsetter in the sense that for the first time, we had a science park. We had a science park where uh, there are a lot of exhibits, a lot of you know, artifacts people can look around. And this has been you know, followed by a number of you know, by science centers, not only in USA, but also in other countries. In fact, UNESCO recognized this concept as a unique informal science learning ambience. Uh, in fact, uh, as a part of this, uh, the part of the science park, we have a number of artifacts. We have a number of artifacts which were uh, set up there in the uh, late 70s or early 80s in the last century. But with the passage of time, due to the uh, extreme humid condition and uh, that is hot and sultry Mumbai climate. These artifacts bear the brunt and uh, it gradually got deteriorated. I will talk to you, uh, yeah, talk to you something about what we have done for, uh, for a section of uh, artifacts. Actually, during the, during the uh, COVID induced lockdown, we are all down because we didn't have any visitors there, but we were not out. We made best use of our you know, time and started restoring the part of the artifacts with the help of heritage section of Indian Railways, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, and some other you know, very proficient uh, restorers of artifacts. In fact, uh, what we did during this time that we had in our, you know, in our collection, narrow gauge railway locomotive. It was a very interesting uh, railway that is a part of very legendary Darjeeling, uh, Darjeeling, uh, Darjeeling Himalayan Railway that was of 19, uh, 1914. So it was in a very bad shape. So we took help of railway, uh, railway authorities to put it back to normal condition. Then also we have in our collection the only DC uh, passenger locomotive that was in, used in the Kalan and uh, Kollan Puna way in the Western India. So the complete restoration, restoring, because in most of the cases, what we have found that original paintings of the artifacts are damaged, almost in very bad shape. Uh, the rusting was evident in places. Joints have given away. Uh, extensive areas, some areas got corroded. Even the undercarriage was damaged. So we were not the people to uh, take help of what we have done that we have taken help of those people. So with all the help, we put the things back, but uh, also we, we, restored, we restored steam wagon. That is also a very unique of a unique, you know, uh, position of 1916. This used to be, um, th this was used in Magellan dock in the Western sector of India uh, to haul the ships into the dry dock. So, that we have also restored. We have restored also the 
1902 tram car which used to be uh, used for the first time in india in calcutta calcutta is a city in the eastern sector so we had this one the uh, electric tram car so we had this problem so we took help of those uh, the uh, experts and put it back into the current condition also we had in our collection this horse drawn tram, tram car that also we have put it back the most interesting part we have in our collections because we targeted six artifacts to be restored during this lockdown period that was we have in our collection this h14 maruti aircraft this maruti aircraft it is of you know hindustan aeronautics limited and it is called the spirit of the tempest and it was india's first indigenously manufactured single pilot fighter jet it was designed to attack from the lower heights and it was very much successfully used in the bangladesh liberation war in the 1972 it was with us the exteriors were in a very bad shape we didn't know what to do but it is it, it has got tremendous importance in the sense that it is the first asian jet fighter to go beyond the test phase and also into successful production and active service so we contacted the hindustan aeronautics divisions and their rush uh, their uh, nasik office they were kind enough to come here and their experts camped, uh, camped here for almost three months and did everything in fact even to restore the paint they brought it from russia because the, that that was the paint which used to be used in the original artifact so this is how we have done we have tried to uh, bring the things back into a very normal condition and we wanted to make it a point that that after this this history you know carriers are spruced up and restored to their formal formal uh, shine these tremendous assortment of vintage vehicles locomotives and aircraft can you know give to the visitors a glorious reminder of their link with the past so at this backdrop what i feel i strongly feel that there should be there should be a regular exchange of ideas exchange of ideas as to how to maintain the and maintain and preserve the artifacts because we do not have that way uh, good um, uh, expertise to handle our huge collections so is and especially in the outdoor areas because science centers and science museums are to some extent different from the archaeology museum or art museum we encourage the people to touch it so that has its you know problem so how to handle how to preserve <laughs> exhibits in the outdoor setting that is an important area where we can exchange of thought the german experts may enlighten their indian counterparts on the best practices to be followed in the context regular training modules if any to practice appropriate uh, conservation practices especially condition reporting then restoration work documentation archiving and uh, displaying in the indoor and outdoor settings may some of the areas which may require further exploration from both the sides and before i end i must uh, reverentially mention the name of my predecessor mr shiva prasad kenet who was instrumental in uh, this reviving this um, uh, artifacts in nehru science center with that i thank you all once again bye thank you mr chaudhary uh, for your uh, remarks uh, uh, so now uh, we will have uh, professor bernard bishop uh, who will be speaking uh, professor uh, bishop is the director general of the leibniz institute for the analysis of biodiversity change and the museum kuning in bonn where he is also a full professor of systemic uh, zoology at the rheinische friedrich wilhelms university Uh, professor uh, bernard bishop's research addresses all aspects of molecular biodiversity from molecular taxonomy to evolutionary genomics seeking to integrate theoretical bioinformatic and empirical approaches to explore the potential of molecular biodiversity research current projects include hybrid swarm evolution in minnows genomic technology for the caucasus and the german barcode of life gbol dark taxa for insects 
His publication numbers in the hundreds. He has been the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards. With this, uh, and he has supervised more than two dozen doctoral uh, dissertations. With these remarks, I would now request uh, uh, Professor Bishop to give his presentation. Thank you very much for this introduction. I was. Can yeah, you understand just, me? Uh, I just request uh, Mr. Deepak. Uh, can you? Uh, uh, I mean, is, is this uh, part of the presentation? Uh, Deepak's presentation is part of uh, the Yes, but I'm trying to get out of the meeting. I'm not used to WebEx before. I'm extremely sorry about this. Uh, OK. Yeah. yeah so so should, I, should I just wait until the screen sharing is off? Um, or... I'm trying to get out of that. One second. Just log out and log in again. OK. Uh, Charlie, you, you can go ahead till uh, we work out this uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's working now, no? Yeah, Professor Bishop, you go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and Excellency and Dr. Varshney. Uh, congratulations to the 75th anniversary of the independence of India. This is certainly a great, great event for all of you guys. I would like to speak a little bit from the perspective of an natural history museum which is in the process as many museums nowadays of a transformation of its goals and essentially the um, perspectives and uh, profiles uh, developing something into the future the essential background is the following we have heard about uh, science centers today and we have heard about um, research museums today and just keep in mind that the term research Research museum was not something commonly used, let's say, 20 years ago. Uh, it has changed. It has changed in a way that um, museums are transforming their activities in combining collection work, research and collections, or um, yeah, research and collections, and science communication in order to develop a new role and a very important role in societies worldwide. And this this is something extremely important to consider and extremely important to keep in mind. What does this um, in particular mean for a natural history museum as ours, uh, as the LIB, or um, called Leibniz Institute for the Analysis of Biodiversity Change, which is part of the Leibniz Research Museum family? It means a lot for us, this transformation process, because first of all, it means that we are engaging in this triad of collections, research, and science communication a very strong in a very strong way so that we never ignore or ne neglect one of these three components which is certainly an important aspect to keep in mind it also means that whenever we do science communications science transfer scientists are involved our science and science communication also involves our collections and it also tries to involve people outside of the museum so the aspect of participation, even in a natural history museum, will become one of the major and important aspects of the activity of history of natural history museums. How can this be achieved? This can be achieved in different ways, but one possibility would be to consider collections as one of the centerpieces of a natural history museum around which research, science, and science transfer, and also participations of people outside of the museum are connected. Keep in mind, for example, we had that project which is called GBOL, German Barcode of Life, which is a project running now since almost 10 years in Germany. And we are coordinating this on a national level. And what we are trying to achieve here is, if you want to um, analyze and understand changes and shifts in biodiversity, very often caused by human impact, you need to be able to very quickly assess biodiversity in certain habitats. Of course, as member of a natural history museum, you're somehow in a perfect position to do this, but in order to do it properly and to do it efficiently, scientists in research museums 
are certainly not in the number to do this. So we need the participation from people out, outside of the museum, amateurs, people trained in insect knowledge or whatever it might be. So here there's a clear connection between um, establishing a link with the society and the efforts um, of generating very quickly knowledge of biodiversity outside. So in order to understand what the causes and the um, sign, uh, biodiversity changes could be. In order to do this, there needs to be a very, very strong connection to people outside of the museum. And this is something we are engaging in. What is also important in this aspect is the knowledge in these museums, the knowledge in the collections, the knowledge in research must be um, openly um, accessible. And this is something which is <laughs> nowadays for us, for all of us, somehow clear that we need to have open science infrastructures accessible to, for everybody on worldwide. But it has not been a clear, clear um, demand or a clear duty of research museums, let's say, 15 to 20 years ago. So we were still in something which we, which we would call an ivory tower, and it's not and in our trans transformation process is now becoming clearer and much more clearer that only an open science infrastructure and open infrastructure provi providing the knowledge and the data we have in each of the collections really helps to engage in solving the classical problems of humankind, which are, for example, not the only one, but very important ones, change of biodiversity, loss of biological resources, and so forth. So with this, we are now engaging in trying to develop joint open um, research infrastructures in Germany in order to provide access to everybody in terms of collections, in terms of research, and in terms of analysis of causes uh, uh, of uh, changes of biodiversity, at least at the national level. However, I would like to emphasize here that the analysis of biodiversity change can never be something um, restricted to a national level. Uh, level. We all know that many species occur transnational. They occur on a specific continent or they migrate or whatever you can think of or, or they invade new areas. So if we are really, if we're really up to engaging in an analysis of the causes of biodiversity change, which is important for all of us, we need to develop international, transnational, open research infrastructures in particular, for example, also in uh, at natural history um, institutions. And this is something we need to engage in. And what we currently do as an example um, within the LIB, we are engaging in the Caucasus region to um, develop joint projects of, of open research infrastructures, joint projects of um, curricula at the universities in order to teach biodiversity, biodiversity change and the knowledge of biodiversity and also biodiversity monitoring, for example, and conservation biology. And this is something where we should essentially define and develop joint projects on an international level so that we can engage together in questions of biodiversity change, which are caused by long range effects. We all know that whenever we use mobiles, whenever we um, develop new technologies, we should never think in, in, a na in a just national scope. And this is something which I would like to place here in that round, that only if we are engaging in joint international research projects, in joint international open research infrastructures, we will be able to solve problems for humankind and for societies in India and in Europe as well. And with this idea and with this presentation, I would like to hand over again to the organizer. Thank you, Professor Misha, for your uh, presentation and your ideas about how we can uh, collaborate uh, between the two countries. Now we have uh, Ms. Sadhana Atavur, who is the director of uh, Vishwesharaya Industrial and Technological Museum in Bengaluru. Uh, she has over three decades of experience in science communication. Her major experience is in designing and developing interactive science exhibits and integrating the hardware and software to create user-friendly learning solutions. 
She has contributed to the development of Science Center network across the country and was instrumental in setting up of uh, a Pilukula Regional Science Center at Mangalore in Karnataka. Currently, she is the director at uh, VITM in Mangalore, which is the southern headquarters of National Council of Science Museum, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. She holds a degree in electronics and communication engineering. I now request uh, uh, Mrs. Sadhana Atavur to make a presentation. Thank you. Thank you for a warm introduction. His Excellency, dignitaries from Germany and India, my colleague and all the participants. Well, good morning, Germany. Good afternoon, India. And as already uh, told in the, in the introduction, I'm heading the Vishesha Industrial and Technological Museum at Bangalore, which is the second museum in the network of National Council of Science Museums. And also it's the southern headquarters of the National Council of Science Museums. And we have a, a good collection uh, from the uh, at the museum. I will be talking about some of the collections of the museum. Uh, the first one is the meter gauge steam locomotive, uh, which was supplied by Dubson Company Glasgow, UK to Southern Maratha Railways in 1888. Only 25 such locomotives were supplied in India. And uh, it, it was operating between uh, Mysore in Karnataka and Ashok Rabbota in Karnataka. And it was uh, ra railworthy. The engine was operational till 1960 when it was donated to the museum. Uh, and James Bunyan was the driver of this engine who used to, after reti uh, retirement, he uh, he's moved to Canada and he used to visit uh, India every year and he's, he, he used to make it a point to visit the museum and see the engine which we drove, drove for many years. So he had an emotional attachment to the collection which was displayed at the uh, museum and once uh, and in, uh, over the years we came to know of his visit and uh, we, uh, we we had a meeting with them and we honored him uh, and uh, and during our golden jubilee celebrations in 2015 we took his permission to use his uh, um, uh, portrait in the model as uh, like he is driving it and he was kind enough to share his uh, yeah, image with us and we made a sculpture of him and that uh, james bunyan is now put uh, in the steam locomotive which we which he drew uh, during the uh, 1960s. So this so the, this is one collection which in which the people are attached to it because the driver used to visit the uh, engine uh, uh, every year. Then the next collection we have got a portable steam engine. Uh, it was manufactured with Marshall Sons and Company from 1840 till 1960s because stationary steam engines are at one place. This this had to be dragged by uh, uh, bullocks are horses to the place uh, where, where uh, to where it, it has to be used, and uh, they use firewood and rice charcoal as the fuel. And such steam engines were used to operate uh, pumps for irrigation purposes or grinding in mills. Uh, one more collection which we have is the reaction turbine, uh, Francis reaction turbine it was, which was manufactured by Boeing and Company London in 1920. It was yes, used in the Shivanathamudra hydroelectric power station of Karnataka which was the first hydel power plant in Asia and Bangalore city also got uh, electricity from this power plant in it was the first uh, Bangalore city was the first city in Asia to get uh, electric lighting in 1905. And uh, in the Chivanathamudra hydroelectric power station, 10 such turbines were used. And we have got one such turbine uh, at the museum, which was donated to the museum by the Mysore State Electricity Board. So this reaction turbine has a lot of uh, uh, historical uh, importance. Then we have got a steam wagon um, made by uh, Mrs. Ali and McLean in Glasgow. And this particular wagon, which is uh, put on display at the museum, uh, was made in 1916, and it was purchased by Mrs. Mathagan Dock, Bombay, around 1917, and it was mainly used to winch and haul the ships in the dry dock. Uh, it was in uh, working condition till 1971, when it had participated in a vintage car rally, and later Mrs. Mathagan Dock donated it to the uh, museum. It is a four-ton capacity. Then we have a stationary steam engine uh, manufactured by Marshall and Sons 
uh, England in 1926. Uh, it was the stationary steam engine was used in Madura Forts, uh, Tirupur in uh, Tamil Nadu. It was used for powering uh, ginning mills. And this particular stationary steam engine uh, was donated to the museum by Madura Forts. Then we have an uh, aircraft engine, twin row radial aircraft engine, which is a 14 cylinder engine. It was manufactured by Wright Aeronautical Corporation USA. Uh, it was introduced in 1939 and it was mainly used in military aircraft and uh, Boeing 314. Then we have also got one more uh, Rolls Royce uh, jet engine that is A1 MK203. Uh, it was used to power the vertical takeoff or landing of VertiJet aircraft. And uh, this particular uh, uh, engine uh, was hit by a bird and the, the engine was refurbished and it was donated to the museum by Rolls-Royce. And a few years back, we had a call from them uh, to check with us whether the engine is still on display at the museum and they wanted a photograph of the engine and we, have, we, we sent it also to them. They wanted to check whether it is still on display. Then we have that Maruti aircraft, uh, which was the first Indian indigenously made the jet aircraft, uh, jet aircraft by Hindustan Aeronautics Corporation Limited, Bangalore. And this engine is uh, uh, is on display at the museum. And the uh, first prototype flew on 17 June 1961. And this engine is regularly uh, maintained by Hindutan Aeronautical uh, Limited. They come regularly with the paint. They have a schedule. They automatically come and they pay, they paint it and maintain the aircraft uh, in good condition. We have a good relationship with the Hindutan Aeronautics Limited Bangalore. Uh, and then we have also a second generation computer, uh, which is as big as a room. Nowadays, uh, children seeing computers which they can hold in the palm. And this is the uh, occupies a full room. Uh, this uh, it was a mainframe computer. Uh, uh, it was in the market in 1959. Uh, this was used in the Karnataka Government Computer Center uh, for printing money order forms uh, for the post office purpose. It was continuously printing, and I, I was uh, instrumental in collecting this second generation computer from the Karnataka Government Computer Center in the 19, uh, during 1989. And uh, it was in working condition. It, uh, it, it had a punch card as the input device and uh, a big printer as an output device. It had a, a huge CPU central processing unit and it has a magnetic tape uh, storage unit. And now it is installed at the museum and if it is connected, it, it still works, but we have, okay, we have just put it on uh, display. Then also we have one, uh, Satellite launch vehicle uh, heat shield of Indian Space Research Organization. It is called the SLV-3 heat shield. It was India's first experimental satellite launch vehicle, uh, which was an, uh, uh, a four-stage uh, 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 rocket, which were all uh, solid stage. And it was launched on July 18, 1980 from Sri Arikota. And uh, our uh, former president of India, Honorable uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, was the project director for this satellite launch vehicle. And this launch, uh, the, uh, more, the, more, more, the heat shield is put on display at the museum and the motor case. And whenever the retired and senior ISRO officials come, they become very emotional with this and they keep on uh, standing at that place for a long time because they have worked with their hands in development of this rocket engine. So it has an emotional, it carry, it, it gives an emotional attachment to the engine also. Yeah, that, thank you. These are, this is the this thing uh, uh, that uh, collections. These are some of the collections of the Vishwesh Museum, and we have been maintaining it uh, uh, as and when it is required. Uh, sometimes we take the help of the companies which we have supplied. Sometimes we do it on our own, and they have been displayed in good condition uh, at the museum. And thank you for the opportunity. I'm uh, happy to be part of this uh, uh, symposium. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sadhana, for your uh, remarks. Now we have uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Janvi Falke. Uh, she is the uh, founding director of Science Canley Bengaluru. 
Uh, previously, uh, Dr. Falke held a tenured faculty position at uh, King's College London. She started her academic career at the University of Heidelberg, following which uh, she was based at Georgia Tech, Lorraine, France, and Imperial College London. Uh, Dr. Falke was fellow of Wissenschaft's College zu Berlin, the Institute of Advanced Study Berlin. Uh, she was also external curator to the Science Museum in London and has been a scholar in residence at the Deutsche Museum Munich. Uh, Dr. Janvi is the author of Atomic State, Big Science in 20th Century India and has co-edited Science of Giants, India, China and India in the 20th Century. She is the producer director of the documentary film Cyclotron. Dr. Janvi reads civics, read civics and politics at the University of Bombay and the School of Oriental and African Studies, London. She holds a doctoral degree in history of science and technology from the Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta. Now I request Dr. Falke uh, to share her uh, views. Dr. Falke, please. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me properly? Yeah, wonderful. So thank you very much. It's, it is, uh, it is a rare occasion uh, when I get to speak and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I've been a scholar in residence at the Deutsches Museum, as Helmut already mentioned, which is when, um, you know, a brief sort of and fragmented collaboration began. Uh, but also the Marut, which was the object that I went there to study, has been uh, has been mentioned more than twice already in this uh, in this meeting, which tells us that at the heart of this uh, at the heart of this meeting is is. Uh, Asia's first jet fighter, which has extremely complicated origins with German aircraft designers, uh, Swiss testing companies, uh, Egyptian test pilots, and Indian aeronautical engineers and designers and manufacturers. And so it, it, is, it is a moment to bring all of this together to see why such a collaboration, as Helmut already pointed, is necessary in order for us to not only further conservation practices, but also uh, the ability to write better histories of these objects and their contribute um, in uh, the direction of what research what research as at museums can do for public debate on the place and space of science and technology uh, in our respective societies. Um, so as we've already gathered from the previous speakers, the Indian Science Museum space is a highly hybrid space. Uh, we have science centers which have historical collections. We have um, uh, you know, science parks, science cities, we have places which largely have dioramas. These places don't necessarily compare one to one with the national museums of Germany and say, for example, the United Kingdom or the Science Museum in Boston, but but are, are their own entity. And I've spent hours, especially in the Vishwishwaraya Museum, but also in the Birla Museum in, uh, 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 in Pilani and in Calcutta, to find that they, they are able to cater to public across the ages and serves a certain public purpose or a, or a social purpose, uh, which historical museums may necessarily not. And so therefore, what is it that we wish to accomplish um, with uh, research at museums? And as Bernhard Misov said, we are in the process, I think in the museum world, largely uh, reimagining our space or our role um, in the public domain in relation to knowledge and therefore in relationship to the public, but also to the university um, and our relationship to, to nature and knowledge uh, itself. And so it is in this process, um, you know, because what is funny and, and of course, you know, we are all colleagues from the museum, so we don't really need reminding of this. But the museum started out, of course, as a collection space related to research where the public had full visibility on the object of inquiry or on the object of research. And they knew what people was, what, what, what science was in a sense studying. And today the distance, today the distance between the object of scientific inquiry and the public is, is, is uh, almost, um, almost uh, cleaved or, or not even cleaved actually, it's cut. And therefore, you know, you can't just walk into a CERN to, to see what the target chamber looks like. You may walk into their experience center, but you can't really walk into. Uh, whereas the museum did serve that purpose at some point of time, as uh, you know, as a sort of large extension of the of the Wunderkammer. And so here we are, uh, you know, uh, trying to see what research can uh, research can do in the public domain, how it can inform or may inform public debate. Uh, and I may uh, and, and allow me a couple of minutes to say something about the science gallery, which I am leading the establishment of uh, in Bangalore. 
Uh, some of you are already very familiar with it, uh, both from the Indian context, but also elsewhere. So I won't uh, bore you with, with, uh, with too many details, but, but just lay in context where the gallery might belong, and especially Science Gallery Bengaluru might belong in this larger discussion on research museums. So, so uh, uh, we are a, uh, science galleries are an international network of university based. Um, uh, well, un they're not university based museums, but university based um, galleries, which are owned by the university in order to create opportunities for public engagement. Um, uh, and the, and the mediating factor, so to speak, is art and creative expression. Uh, we have scholars from across disciplines coming together with artists from across disciplines and at their convergence are artifacts, ideas, programs that allow for the public to find their place. Now, uh, in Bengaluru, what we are trying to do is to extend that role from being only a place for display or showcase of what comes out of research and art coming together to establish a space where that collaboration itself becomes possible and therefore new ideas and new research itself becomes possible. And so what we are initiating is something that again belongs probably way back in the past where the museum also belongs. Uh, we are working with the idea of a public lab complex or a public laboratory complex with five experimental spaces um, that help us reimagine, uh, well, that, that will help those who engage into inquiry across disciplines to reimagine our relationship to nature. And so it is, it, it is, uh, it borrows or mirrors different kinds of public spaces for science and brings it together. So as such, we don't have collections of our own. We don't also collect, but we borrow from collections and we uh, uh, use historical objects to contribute um, to further questions to just give you a couple of examples. So when we did our exhibition on water, we had two uh, objects of historical importance in uh, the exhibition, which also led to workshops, which got uh, students not only from um, climate sciences, but also from mathematics and history together. And that was the first data logger for, uh, sorry, not the first data logger, the data logger for the first monsoon experiments in India. And so this is the kind of work we do where we bring history, uh, contemporary interests and creative expression together in order to get input from the public and to provide to the public a doorway into what science might mean um, for their day-to-day -day lives and, and thus create the opportunity for a more informed public debate, probably in about 100 years time, not in my lifetime. But nonetheless, uh, you know, the effort has to begin somewhere and, um, and, it, and, and it has. So what, one, what I can say in, in, in sort of, you know, in sum is that this is, uh, it's, it, we are doing our best for this to not be a pedagogical enterprise, but one that actually allows for um, something uh, that uh, Professor Bush said right at the start, which is to create, a, a create an environment, a democratic environment or where democracy um, has the space for knowledge, but so, sorry, where democracy intersects with knowledge-based societies, which we have become today, right? And so what is the relationship between society, democracy, um, and, and where knowledge is, is sort of the intervening factor or the interface and, and you know, how that, how that might actually factor out? Because, you know, none of us can ignore today um, electoral behavior uh, as influenced by uh, social media, Cambridge Analytica, algorithms, um, you know, neither can we understand uh, stock trading without understanding how computation um, and computing power itself has been harnessed to make something like that possible. And so therefore, it, it, it is essential for democracy that a cultural conversation around science is um, grounded, is instituted, because I think, especially in India, and, and I will never tire of saying this, and you'll hear me saying this again and again, we have a very strong professional conversation around science in India. We don't have a cultural one. What do I mean by that? We, in India, when we talk about science and engineering, and, and of course, what I mean to say is that while there, are, while there are things specific to India, of course, in Germany, it takes other forms. Uh, and, and, you know, to, to lesser or more, uh, you know, the degrees might be lesser or more, but what we have here is a conversation about science and engineering, which is about grades, about admissions, about schools and colleges, about professions, about upward social mobility, but it is rarely a dinner time conversation about, so what's your project? What does this mean for us? Why does it matter? And I think it is important if we want to have it, if we want to have democratic societies, if our understanding of good society is democratic society, that we build that interface 
which allows us to to have better knowledge based society so with that i'll i'll stop and thank you very much for the invitation um and thank you very much for your time thank you dr falke for your nice uh, talk uh, now we will have a presentation by uh, dr katya zazar I would say without Dr. Katya's help, this symposium would not have been possible. So before introducing, I would like to thank her for helping and facilitating this uh, particular online symposium. Uh, Dr. Katya is International Outreach Officer for the Library Research Museums. Uh, she was an undergraduate at Yale University USA and received her PhD in History from Harvard University in 2005. Seeking to diversify approaches and organizational structures within cultural, educational, and research institutions, her work has led to positions at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles, the Stanford Humanities Center, the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., and the United States National Endowment for the Humanities. After immigrating to Germany in 2017, she has overseen various international projects at the University of Münster and the Leibniz Association headquarters in Berlin. She is an experienced leader in culture and higher education sectors. Her specialties are new ventures, strategic analysis, and change management. She is committed to increasing diversity in museums and internationalizing research organizations. So, Dr. Katya will now take the proceedings onwards. Thank you very much, Katya, for uh, uh, your help and facilitating this museum. Now you can take over uh, the subsequent uh, presentations. Dr. Katya. Thanks so much. It's been a great honor to make this program happen. And um, I'm very excited to participate in the elixir of freedom. I love freedom. And uh, I, too, have a, a national history of independence, which uh, we celebrate in a different rhythm. But we're coming up on another celebration in the United States as well. Uh, from the same colonizer as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> um, I will not actually make a presentation. I will start to initiate actually some uh, research presentations uh, of these wonderful lifeblood collaborations that we talked about between Indian and German researchers. So without further ado, I'd like to start Excuse me, I'd like to start by introducing our first presenters. Um, and they are Ralf Britz, who is the head of the ichthyology section of the Senckenberg Natural History Collections in Dresden. He's worked previously at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, the National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution, and uh, the Natural History Museum in London. He is a classically trained zoologist who studies the anatomy, taxonomy, and evolution of fishes, recently focusing on the freshwater fish fauna of the Western Ghats in India. He's published over 160 peer-reviewed research papers and described more than 70 new species, seven new genera, and two new families of freshwater fishes. He and Rajiv Raghavan, who will who I will introduce next, have been collaborating since 2011, which is wonderful. Uh, Rajiv Raghavan is an assistant professor at the Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies, KUFOS, in Kochi, India, where his team studies fundamental and applied aspects of tropical aquatic biodiversity, including taxonomy, molecular ecology, and conservation. Rajiv is actively involved with the work of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, and is currently the South Asia Chair of the IUCN's Freshwater Fish Specialist Group, and also the IUCN's Freshwater Fish Red List Authority Coordinator for the continents of Asia and Oceania. He has published extensively with over 180 papers in leading journals in fisheries science and biodiversity conservation. So what I would suggest uh, we do is uh, hear the presentation and um, move to the next presentations um, and then the last presentation and then we will have a, a question and a answer period and if you would like please um, 
focus your questions should you have them in the chat and I will collect them um, so that at the end maybe we'll have if there is time some some fulsome discussion of the theories and politics that we've been discussing in the first half thanks so much off to you good morning everyone good afternoon also um, Your Excellency, it's great to be invited to this event and show you in about five minutes what Rajiv and I have been doing in the last 10 years. So it's going to be a run through a lot of slides. And I hope the sharing part works here. Let's see. Let's see if I can get this done. Can't just open this easy. Okay, here we go. Does that work? No, it doesn't. Why not? I can't seem to share the file. Why is that? Can anyone help me? No, I can't share it. What's going on? Perhaps you need to be made co-presenter. Is that a possibility? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, probably that is required. We're trying. I mean, we just we just give a minute, so we are trying to make uh, the co-presenter. That's fine. Because that will also apply. Oh, look at that. Here we go. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. OK, now. In the presentation mode, we can actually see. Yes, but now I need to find. I can't see. No, no, this is also good enough. You please go ahead. I mean, if you can't see it. You can see me and you can hear Yeah, me. yeah, no, it's yeah. fine. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Okay. So most of my work in India has been on the Western Ghats, and I don't need to tell you that this is an, an, an interesting area of India, a mountain range that um, runs parallel to the west coast of India and in the, in the south mostly. And that Western Ghats area has about 300 species of freshwater fishes and close to 200 are endemic to this region. They don't occur anywhere else in the world. And how did I get to study these? Well, it, it all started in 2010 when I was still working at the Natural History Museum in London, when this lady, um, Dr. Rema Devi from ZSI Chennai visited me. She was on a, on a workshop in London and she used the opportunity to drop into the museum. And she brought along with her this young gentleman, Rajab Raghavan. Now, when, when they went back, Rema Devi soon after that retired, but I kept in touch with Rajiv and we made plans for me to come to India and go on a collecting trip. And that's what we did in 2012. And along came two of Rajiv's colleagues, Sibi Philip and Anwar Ali, and a friend of ours, Nikhil Sood from Bangalore. And the five of us um, collected fishes in a small area in the north of Kerala, and then also in southern Karnataka. And based on this collection, we already discovered four new species of freshwater fishes. Now, one has to know that Kerala is one of the best known areas in terms of its freshwater fishes in India. So discovering four new species and actually clarifying what this fish on the upper right really is and where it occurs, that was kind of surprising, completely unexpected, and that triggered, of course, an initiative to find out more about this interesting fish fauna of the Western Ghats. So in total, I've been to India now six times, from 2012, the last time in 2019, shortly before COVID hit us all, and we've 
collected in various places. We got really interesting fishes from there, but it also opened the opportunity for me to meet Rajiv and some of his colleagues. So here are some of the students in his lab. And I also got to know some of his professional colleagues like Nilesh Tahanuka, who now is at the Shiv Nadar University in Delhi, and some of his students. So by meeting Rajiv initially, I was able to expand this network of friends, colleagues, collaborators in India quite a lot. Now, since 2011, we have now published 22 peer-reviewed papers. We describe two new families, and Rajiv will say something about that in his talk. One new genus and a total of nine new species between the, uh, his research group and myself. But of course, they found many, many more new species that they named, described without my participation because they um, had enough knowledge about those um, fish groups. Now, the most interesting one, and that's the one I really want to show you, and Rajiv again will talk about this in his talk a little more, was this animal. This is only about 10 centimeters in length. It was collected from a rice field in Kerala shortly after these devastating floods in August 2018 hit Kerala. They appeared in the rice field. They were collected by a local person who understood, recognized that this is something really interesting and eventually led to a contact to Rajiv, who was able to obtain these fishes, preserve them, and we studied them together. And we found that this fish is quite extraordinary because we couldn't assign it to any known genus, any known species, of course. So we described a new species and new genus for this fish, and we call it Enigma chana, which means the enigmatic snakehead, in Gollum, of course, because um, it was living in this kind of muddy, um, subterranean um, kind of habitat. And Roger will talk about this again a little more. So that was really the highlight of um, our collaboration so far, but it got even more interesting when we were able to get a specimen and CT scan it at the facilities back then still in London. And we discovered that it has a large number of very, very unusual characters, which in the end led us to make Enigma Chana Gollum a family of its own, the Enigma Chanidae, and that was published in 2020. And this caused quite a stir in the scientific community. Now, all of that now has led to a collaboration, a collaborative project for which we just got funding, which will enable an Indian researcher to come here to Dresden, join an American researcher and another German um, zoology student to work on these really strange, often bizarre, anatomically bizarre, fishes from the Western Ghats, and we hope to CT scan about 20 of these really weird lineages to understand their anatomy better. And this will also help us in a larger project that looks at the genomic side of these strange Western Ghats fishes. And actually, that brings me to the end. And this slide illustrate, illustrates that working in India is always a lot of fun. Thank you. Wonderful. I think, Rajav, you can take over uh, at any point. How do I unshare? Oh, it's done. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so I think Ralph has made my life uh, easier. He's given you uh, an introduction about the fascinating uh, biodiversity that the Western Ghats of India harbors. So I'll just share my screen and see it's possible. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yes, okay, right. So, um, Ralph uh, told you a little bit about this uh, very fascinating uh, fish diversity that we have. 
in the Western Ghats, and he uh, mentioned that we, there are around 300 uh, species or 300 or more species of fish. So uh, I would say that 95% of them uh, live in uh, you know, conventional uh, freshwater habitats like rivers, streams, uh, wetlands, etc. But there's also uh, a very small but very unique group of fish that live beneath uh, the Earth's surface. So there's lots of very interesting fish that live in uh, aquifers, uh, burrowing in wetlands, in paddy fields, and they come out in uh, dugout wells uh, you know, at night in these wetlands. And so this was a very recent paper uh, that uh, Ralph, uh, myself, and a colleague, uh, Neelish, who uh, Ralph introduced, uh, published uh, a few months ago where we uh, introduced this very fascinating uh, fauna that we have in the Western Ghats, uh, talked about uh, how unique they are in terms of their uh, evolution, their morphology, and why they need uh, urgent uh, conservation attention. So this was for the first time that uh, we managed to bring uh, a global attention uh, to these unique uh, organisms that live in, in this part of the world. Uh, so much of these, or I would say all of these organisms have extremely uh, interesting uh, features, uh, be it their morphology. So you can see from these uh, photographs that many of these fish have no eyes, uh, they're blind. Uh, many of uh, the fins have been lost uh, as part of the evolutionary process. Uh, there are no pigments, so they're unique in every respect that you can think of. And uh, this was uh, a media a report that uh, was published uh, based on Ralph's uh, and our team's uh, discovery of a, a completely new genus of uh, aquifer dwelling uh, blind eels. So I think this was a report from the Senckenberg uh, Research Institute uh, in, in Dresden. Then uh, uh, the golem snakehead that Ralph talked to you about uh, was one of our most interesting finds uh, of all the 10 years of collaboration that uh, Ralph and our team uh, has been having. Uh, so this was a very unique uh, find, uh, not only in, in, in the sense of uh, an, a fish uh, under the ground, but also in the sense that it was a very ancient uh, a fish. So as you can see from uh, a genetic analysis that we did as part of our uh, paper uh, in published in uh, scientific reports, that this fish was almost 100 million years old, which means that it lived with dinosaurs. Uh, or I would say in, in the Gondwan uh, continent. So there were fish that are not only unique from their morphology, but they're also extremely old, very ancient relic uh, species. So when we talk about uh, new discoveries, so Ralph uh, did mention that we discovered lots of new species, uh, some new genus, but it's not very often that uh, there are discoveries of new families uh, being made across the world, especially in, in, in fish. Uh, in the fish world. So I think if you take the last 10, 20 years, possibly not more than five or six uh, new families of fish that have been uh, discovered. But interestingly, two of these uh, fish families that have been discovered or described over the last 10 years uh, you know, were part of the studies that Ralph and our team have been doing together. So one was uh, Cryptoglanidae, uh, the one on the left, uh, which was again a, a subterranean uh, catfish. And then uh, the, the golem snake at Enigma Chanide. Uh, so both of them very evolutionary distinct uh, groups of uh, fish. So they are evolutionary distinct, they're very ancient, they have unique morphologies. And very interestingly, many of these were unexpected discoveries. So by unexpected, uh, you know, of course, yes, finding something from under the ground or in, in subterranean waters is always uh, unexpected and interesting. But what uh, has made this more interesting is that no one in the world or no one in the fish world would have expected to discover a snakehead fish from a subterranean system or an eel loach. So both of these are normally fish that live in surface water habitats, streams, rivers, lakes, uh, reservoirs. And so this was for the first time in the world that we discovered that there are groups of fish, uh, I mean, species of fish within these uh, fish groups like snakeheads and eel loaches that live under the ground uh, or in, in subterranean water. So these were really unexpected, very interesting uh, discoveries. And where do you find them and how do you find them? So it's not very easy to find these fish. Uh, it's just mostly serendipity that uh, plays a, a role, uh, very opportunistic discoveries, but also uh, our students, collaborators work in very uh, interesting habitats as you can see a student deep down in a well in a dugout well 
in the state of Kerala, uh, finding fish in caves and also uh, at least unexpected places like an overhead storage tank uh, from where water uh, is pumped in from these uh, aquifers. So all of these are very unconventional habitats from where you can find fish, but you know they do uh, lead to a discovery of extremely interesting uh, fish species, even at the highest uh, taxonomic level. So more than uh, conventional field surveys, it is citizen science that has helped us uh, improve our knowledge in all these uh, interesting groups of fish. So most often it's the, the kids at home, the local communities who often find these uh, fish from their wells, uh, which pop up in their tanks and their buckets, et cetera. And so citizen science has helped us uh, to a great extent in, in understanding and improving our knowledge on, on these uh, groups of fish. So there's Ralph talking to a, a group of villagers uh, during one of his visits uh, to, to uh, our, our place in Kerala. Uh, so despite of all this very interesting uh, facets of subterranean biodiversity, so all of these fish are extremely threatened by a range of uh, anthropogenic uh, stressors. There's huge, uh, no, uh, oh, I would say, extensive uh, reclamation of wetlands uh, for you know, uh, industrial parks, for apartments, for you know, different urban uh, settlements. There are more new wells being uh, dug, which act as traps and, and the fish are caught. There's lots of laterite mining uh, that happens uh, for uh, the construction purposes. So all of these uh, are some of the most significant threats that impact these uh, unique uh, organisms. So why, why do we need international collaborations? Uh, so most of these fish, as I said, are very unique. Uh, some of them are uh, you know, biogeographically, you know, biogeographically unique in the sense that uh, their relatives are somewhere in, in Africa, in, in South America, in, in parts of Southeast Asia, and therefore we need uh, an international team of researchers to work on uh, solving different aspects of their evolution, their phylogenetics, their biogeography, etc. So it's not something that uh, one person or a few person within, within India can do. So we need extensive international collaborations, and we are glad that uh, Ralph has been uh, of, of extreme help uh, in, in solving many of these interesting uh, puzzles that we've got. So with that, I would uh, you know, end uh, this talk and, and say that you know, uh, the, the collaboration between uh, Ralph's team and us have been uh, going on for the last 10 years since Ralph was in London. And now since he's moved to Sankenberg in, in Dresden, I'm sure this, this collaboration would only pick up. And as he already told you, we have a very interesting project uh, that's been funded for which uh, one of our team members is, uh, will probably travel to, to Germany in the next uh, few months and start working on the next stage of, of this project, trying to uh, unravel some of these uh, mysteries. So thank you very much. It's a fabulous introduction to all of our different collaborations with one another. And I am very eager to hear people's questions. You haven't been very active in the chat. People, let's um, get going, ask some difficult questions, make them sweat, perspire. Um, now we are going to um, the next pairing, which um, begins with our researcher Deepak Verapan, who is a herpetologist from Chennai, India, with interests in ecology, evolution, systematics, natural history, and biogeography. He is currently a Humboldt postdoc at the Senckenberg Natural History Museum in Dresden. Deepak has been involved in scientific research in South Asia since 2004, focusing on herpetofauna. I hope I said that correctly. I'm a historian, you know. <laughs> He started his research on lizards in the Western Ghats in 2004 and continued to work in the Ghats on the ecology and behavior of tortoises for his PhD. His own surveys across India as part of his research along with collaborative work led to this led to the discovery of 31 new species of reptiles and recognition of a new subfamily of snakes. And I'm not going to attempt to say the name. Deepak has been working on museum collections in India since 2012 and in Europe since 2017, and he is committed to conservation of herpetofauna and their habitats. I will also introduce um, Pratyush Mohapatra, who is working as a senior scientist in the Zoological Survey of India with broad interests in the fields of animal taxonomy, evolution, and conservation. 
He works on varied faunal groups, specifically on reptiles, amphibians, and scorpions, and he has described 13 new species in collaboration with researchers from India and abroad. He is pursuing his interest to stabilize taxonomic discrepancies in Indian reptiles, and for two decades he's been working closely with various local communities and organizations in eastern and central India to understand the ground reality of biodiversity that connects to some of these social aspects we were talking about earlier, and conservation issues with threats on species. In the field of conservation, he has contributed to the IUCN Red List assessments for more than 113 species of South Asian reptiles. All right. Here we go. Great. Thank you, Katya. Thank You're you, His Excellency, welcome. for this opportunity for me to present at the uh, this symposium. I'll now share my slide. Um, can you all see my slide? Is it visible? It's visible. You can go ahead, um, Dr. Deepak. Yeah. Okay. So we share our planet with diverse life forms. And even though our uh, tools to document this diversity has changed over uh, centuries, our quest to document this diversity is a continuous process. And we've been documenting diversity for more than three centuries. And a vast majority of this uh, documentation has been collected and been deposited in museums, both in uh, national and international repositories. And uh, this incredible diversity of life on Earth is also unevenly distributed. And why this unevenness in diversity and how uh, uh, the species originated are some of the fundamental questions biologists ask uh, in, uh, in uh, research. And as you see in the previous map, uh, India is one of the high diverse biodiverse areas and uh, both in flora and fauna. And this has also been studied for more than three centuries. And many of these specimens were moved to Europe uh, during that time. And therefore, it's very difficult to carry out taxonomic and systematic research without collaborations between museums in India and Europe. So I'll dive into the subject of my interest. Indian herpetofauna, as Katya mentioned, I've been studying this group since 2004. And in India, we have 729 species of reptiles and 450 species of amphibians. That's like 5% and 6% of global diversity, although it might be sounding small percentage, but approximately 60% of this 6% and 5% is endemic to India and no ends in the world. So one of the case studies I'm talking about today is on uh, this group of snakes called uh, banded racers, which is found across India. It was first described in 1796 based on a specimen from Vishakapatnam in uh, the East Coast. And uh, around the same time, there was another species described called Lycodon anomalensis. And for more than two centuries, researchers confused the names of these two species because somebody mislabeled one of the plates uh, at that time. And uh, it was also considered as a different genus, but uh, molecular uh, data shows that this species belonged to a, a genus called Platyceps. So that's about study which we published last year. And uh, based on DNA evidence in 2015, we had a tentative new species from Tamil Nadu. And uh, we collaborated with museum uh, researchers in Berlin and also with Pratyush uh, in uh, ZSI India. And we had to look at specimens from six European museums, four Indian museum and three American museum. And we also compared micro CT scans to find out differences between these two species and if they are actually in this genera. So some of the main challenges during these studies were uh, examining historical specimen. It's not easy to loan specimen into India. So we had to take our help of European collaborators who could loan specimens from across the world and we could study these specimens. And the second uh, uh, challenge was uh, original paintings. Uh, although many of these are digitized now, there are some special collections which are in European museums and libraries which are difficult to access and micro CT scanning facilities. At that time in 2017, there was only few, very few facilities which were available for this. 
and we took this for this study we took a specimen all the way to pune from bangalore to get it scanned and uh, compare it for this study and also one of the uh, thing which we found difficult is that is although the central uh, uh, station in calcutta has a very good catalog the ca there is not a centralized database for specimens uh, in regional stations in zirisai so the second study i'll be talking about is a case study on this uh, snakes called wood snakes it's a uh, genus xylophis they are endemic to western ghats and it's due to its similarity to, to other burrowing snakes in uh, this species was placed in various uh, families in the past for 200 years and in 2016 uh, we compared dna data for freshly collected samples from the western ghats and it was not matching with any of the species which it was previously described so in 2017 uh, uh, collaborate uh, uh, researchers from the us museum they looked at uh, wet collections of uh, various uh, specimens of snakes and they found out that wood snakes are not not actually related to any other burrowing forms they are actually related to an arboreal species which are found in uh, south and southeast asia so we have seen this with western guards and we collaborated with uh, one of the researchers sara in the us and we described a whole new subfamily of uh, snake from the western ghats and they were indeed uh, sisters to this widespread species what you see in blue on the right uh, widespread genera uh, parias they they specialize eating on snails whereas the wood snakes are feeding on earthworms in the western ghats so that was a very surprising research Uh, my current project is on historic dna from museum samples in comparison with fresh dna material to understand genetic diversity of two large soft shells so one of them is the uh, asian giant soft shell pilocallis cantori it's distributed from philippines all the way to uh, peninsular india and the other species is very interesting it's found only in peninsular india it's endemic to peninsular india and nowhere else in the world so i'm trying to use cutting edge ancient dna extraction methods with uh, professor dr fritz and uh, try to understand how they are related to each other so to summarize historical museum collections are invaluable resources for us in time and taxonomic research is our foundation for understanding biodiversity and uh, we are equipped with amazing technology at the moment and we need to explore it and it is clear that both indian and european museum hold important collection for research and collaboration between these museums are vital and uh, research exchange programs and loaning samples between india and germany could help accelerate research in taxonomy and uh, knowledge transfer with that uh, i would uh, finish my talk and i'd like to acknowledge lot of funding agencies and uh, uh, for the opportunity to present uh, at this uh, symposium thank you very much for we can continue with pratyush we we're, we're flying between everyone everyone am i audible oh, yeah. Yeah. okay okay so uh, my talk will be complementing what deepak told and but i'll be like talking specifically regarding uh, how this indian and european contribute like collaboration uh, is necessary and how how strong it is sorry okay so uh, when we see the history of india and european uh, uh, like collaboration or linkages so it takes back to like 18th and 19th centuries when uh, lots of europeans they they came to india to learn many of the natural uh, natural history information and it's been nicely depicted by uh, rajesh kochar in uh, 2013 there is a very nice paper on the history of uh, natural history of india 
So in which like uh, there were many places, like very specific places in South India and Eastern India. So where Europeans came and lots of collections are now in the European Museum. So I'll talk about why these are important for any Indian taxonomist, because like uh, while dealing with taxonomy, we have to like follow uh, certain principles and certain uh, like uh, the IC data, uh, for example. So, and uh, we heard about lots of collaboration between uh, science centers and uh, like European uh, counterparts. But when it comes to taxonomy, already we have like three presentations on that. But in my talk, I'll be talking largely about like why it is important because uh, so taxonomy is the basis for any meaningful research in biology and without taxonomy, without the name of a species. So we cannot do uh, further like any advanced work. And it was like uh, very rightly Carl von Linney is known as the father of, father of modern taxonomy because he proposed a very unique uh, like uh, naming system for animals, the binomial nomenclature. And after that, uh, so India was exposed uh, by lots of Europeans to come and collect natural history information. And many of the collections were also referred by Carl von Linney in his System and Nature. And I'll be talking about like what are the important contributions uh, in the field of uh, reptiles and specifically in the field of snake taxonomy. So, uh, and uh, like uh, the thing is that like many of the old collections and many of the old description of species uh, which are in European museums, uh, uh, so which we called as type species basically, uh, so which is based on specimens collected or there are also many old historical collections or historically described species which are only known from uh, the iconotypes <laughs> or it is based on a painting or based on any kind of like uh, information related to it. And uh, many of the original descriptions are also in European language, which uh, before a few years, it was difficult for us to decipher. So we had strong collaboration with European um, uh, scientists who are working on that group uh, to uh, find out like about the original description on the basis of which uh, uh, when we are doing any taxonomic work, we need that. And uh, uh, now like uh, thanks to Biodiversity Heritage Library, uh, which holds a lot of like old collections of literature, so which is helping us in, in uh, doing that. So if I talk about the, uh, like about the snakes uh, and about the uh, valid snake species, so in which we have now 335 species of snakes and by uh, the independence of India, like almost 300 species were already known, the valid uh, species of snakes. And uh, uh, till 1900, some 250 species were known. So uh, this is important because uh, many of the historical collections are not supported with uh, much of information. So while dealing with those species, we need to uh, either like study the specimen, re-examine the specimen again, as Deepak has already shown uh, during the racer work in that uh, snake work, we had to face lots of difficulties and there was a name, a shifting of name from one genus to another. And in this slide also I have shown you uh, in a paper, it has been cited like what are the top 25 museums across the world, uh, which holds reptile collections. And in that, uh, like Geological Survey of India is one of them. But uh, uh, as Deepak has already pointed out, like uh, there was no formal uh, information about how many specimens are housed uh, in other other regional centers of GSI and about the type specimens which are also found in other regional centers apart from GSI headquarter Kolkata. Uh, these are a few of the important contribution uh, contributors like Carl von Lini. I was talking about he has described so many plants and animals in his system and nature in the ten volumes and many of the specimens are still there but there are lots of like taxonomic problems related to uh, these species because many in many of the cases, the type locality is very vague or it was like India orientally, or in some cases like the type locality information is also wrong. For example, in, in case of uh, Lycodon olicus, a very common snake, which is found in India and Sri Lanka and most parts of South Asia. So in this case, the type locality was America. But uh, in that case, like the museum holdings, like the linears, uh, based on the specimen on which Linnaeus has described the species. So getting information, morphological characters about that species is also very important to delineate 
these widely distributed uh, species of snakes. Uh, and uh, similarly, Snader has very uh, like lots of important contribution, and some of his specimens are in British Museum, but many of them are in the European Museum. He has also described many species which are very commonly found in India. And nowadays, we we know that there are cryptic diversity in these widely distributed species. Uh, similar contribution by Daudin, he has uh, like studied most of the paintings made by Russell. And uh, uh, so he has not been to India, but he has studied extensively the paintings. And uh, from that, he has described species. So it's uh, for a taxonomist, even the name, the nomenclature part is also very important, which takes us back to the history to find out literature, to find out writings and uh, like scripts written by the authors and then match with uh, those information, with uh, those little information you have to process. Uh, uh, Merem's work, Deepak just cited like how uh, uh, the description of Merem, he has described few lines and based on that also a species uh, uh, means has been authored, like the author name has been shifted from Saw to Merem. So in that way, like it's very complex uh, history uh, of, of that particular snake we dealt with. Uh, uh, other things uh, like the, I also did some homework to find out like what are the important and commonly distributed, widely distributed species which are in the uh, European museums on which like we have started working and uh, so uh, through through many collaborations uh, in the European museums, especially in Germany. And coming to the institute where I work, Geological Survey of India uh, is uh, is established in 1916. And it was uh, when it was separated from the Indian museums, which is one of the like oldest uh, uh, museum in the country, uh, established by the Britishers, and uh, uh, it has a very uh, uh, like wide range of taxonomies. Uh, those who work in Jadeci from Protozoa to Mammalia, and we have nearly 5.6 million specimens of all faunal groups. I'll just be briefing about that. So coming to the type specimen, Jadeci holds uh, 17,000 type specimens of different uh, taxa, and uh, there are many vulture specimens. And Jadeci also holds uh, all the geological collections in Indian Museum were shifted to Jadeci, and some were also transferred to British Museum when Britishers left India. And we have collections from 56 uh, different countries. And this is the uh, like uh, collection in the headquarter as well as the regional centers. We have 16 regional centers in, across India, which also holds a lot of specimens as well as uh, type specimens are deposited there. Uh, uh, currently, Jadesai's approach and Jadesai's way, way of working has changed uh, drastically. And uh, uh, now almost all the type specimens are digitized and uh, we have also barcoded lots of like uh, species uh, and uh, till uh, like now nearly 8,000 uh, species have been uh, barcoded. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, what I expect, like we have also several uh, international collaborations. We have recently uh, joined hand with National History Museum and uh, the Union Cabinet has also approved uh, like international barcode of life project with JEDSI. So in which like uh, uh, what I expect from this uh, platform, like there should be some formal collaborations. All those scientists are working uh, independently or in their personal capacity, uh, working with the uh, European uh, friends, uh, but it needs a formal collaboration so that like we can uh, in different uh, uh, taxa, like we can uh, exchange a lot of things, a lot of like uh, information about specimens as it is not possible to uh, go for loaning of specimens uh, as per the strict uh, laws uh, in the country. Uh, so, but apart from that, like formal collaborations can be strengthened and uh, to, to address the taxonomic shortfalls, uh, basically in, in, in many groups, like in almost all the groups, lots of collection. I can give example of Galatia expedition, which happened uh, by Dutch. Uh, so it, they have also lots of uh, specimens from uh, Great Nicobar Island. So and many of the specimens are not yet uh, like been uh, uh, been studied. So uh, so so that like uh, many collections are there which uh, are necessary for uh, such like fixing the taxonomic errors uh, in in reptiles as well as in other groups. 
and we can also extend uh, like uh, these indo german research platforms so that like there can be a scientific exchange uh, and uh, uh, so which which can be strengthened and for taxonomy especially uh, if there is any possibility so because taxonomy deals with history and we have a very strong history uh, with europeans so i would request uh, uh, as we have uh, dr vartne from dst so there are many programs he can also brief like how those programs can be utilized at government level so that in federal level we have strong collaboration with european museums thank you very much i would also like to acknowledge um, my director uh, dr dilti banerji who is the first uh, female director of jsi apart from that there are many friends in germany as well as india uh, with uh, whom like uh, i work uh, at my personal capacity thank you and look forward for a wonderful collaboration thank you so much for two even more inspiring presentations we have one more presentation um and maybe we can take off yes perfect our last presentation but definitely not least is um by puja a anil kumar who studied oep biology and has an international master's degree uh, from the University of Bonn in Germany. She is from the southern Indian province of Kerala, India, India and she earned her bachelor's and master's degree, her first <laughs> master's degree in zoology from two Indian colleges. She then came to Bonn to pursue a second master's degree in OEP biology, which she completed in October 2021. Her studies focus on the systematics of Indian millipedes, currently concentrating on the fauna of the Western Ghats. She seeks to explore the ecological, evolutionary, and biogeographic processes that have shaped the current diversity of millipedes in the Indian subcontinent. Her work encompasses a variety of approaches, including traditional taxonomic descriptions, molecular phylogeny and systematics, and biogeographic methods to understand the evolution and diversity of the various Indian millipede groups. The research facilities of the Leibniz Institute for the analysis of biodiversity change enabled her to use modern methods such as molecular barcoding for biodiversity inventory studies in her home country. These methods were used for the first time to study India's unique soil fauna. She's currently working as a student assistant in the research group of Dr. Thomas Wiesner, head and curator of the Miria Poda section at the Zoological Research Museum Alexander Koenig in Bonn, Germany. Puja, I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you, Gaja. Thank you for that. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Yeah. And thank you for the very warm introduction. So I will share my screen now. So, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, please go ahead. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Pujaya Anur Kumar, and I'm from the Alexander Museum Kyonik in Bonn, and I'm studying on the millipedes of the Indian subcontinent. So here is a brief introduction. So millipedes are basically soil organisms with a very high morphological diversity, like leading into 16 orders of plant diplopoda. And they are basically excellent detritivores and they will play a vital role in organic farming and regulation of nutrient cycles. So going to Indian millipedes, they were basically, uh, were, let's say, studied like 90% of the Indian millipedes were described during the colonial times. And at the post-colonial period, let's say for the past 75 years, they have been, the, the rate of description is quite low. However, there were lots of studies, especially on the ecology, their energetics, uh, their population dynamics, their distribution was coming from the Indian subcontinent. But here, one of the major problems we found was like the species they used to do all these kinds of studies were identified wrong. However, there was a checklist put by Sergei Golovosh and my supervisor Thomas Wiesner in 2016 
uh, and here we say, I mean, they reported like India has 270 species. But when we compared it to other countries like Italy, it had 450 species and Tanzania at 276 species, which are actually much smaller country comparing with the Indian biogeographic landmass, which means that Indian millipedes are actually highly understudied. So in 2016, actually, I came, came to con in contact with Sir Guy Golowash and Thomas Wiesener. And Thomas and I asked them for a training on Indian millipedes because, like, due to its morphological diversity, it's quite difficult to start at first. So each group has to be tightened in their own way. So Thomas Wiesener actually suggested me and encouraged me to take the International Master Degree Program, OEP, where he said that he could provide me with trainings. So for my OEP master thesis, actually, uh, due to this whole knowledge gap of 75 years, we decided to do a biodiversity inventory study in the Indian Biodiversity Hotspot, that is the Western Ghats. So I collected millipedes from the southern Western Ghats of Kerala, the province I come from, and I barcoded them for the mitochondrial gene CO1. So in my studies, it incorporated 11 groups of millipedes. And here we could see that exclusively from the southern western girls of Kerala, we got like 144 native species, where the entire Indian continent had only 270, which is like more 53 percentage of the entire Indian species, which again suggests that there is a hidden diversity of millipedes in the Indian subcontinent. Besides that, we were able to contribute the very first CO1 DNA barcode library of millipedes from the Indian Western Girls. And also, this was the first extensive barcode study on Indian millipedes and also on three millipede orders and three millipede families. So this is something I'm currently working on, try, um, working on the manuscript for publication. So right now I'm uh, trying to do like morphological identification. So in each group I uh, take, there will be a new species or a new genera, which are actually under preparation. So the advantage actually I received staying at the Leibniz Research Museum was uh, I had to do a five week field work in the Southern Western Ghats of Kerala, and it was funded by the Alexander Kaunik Society housed at Museum Kaunik. And I, the best thing actually part of this uh, is that we can actually apply for multiple funds for multiple events in a year and the processing time will only take out two weeks where we need to write a proposal of like two pages. And the best part is like anyone in ZFMK can apply, let it be a master student, let it be a PhD or a postdoc. And I actually was able to do this study because of the National Biodiversity Authority where they gave me the material transfer agreement incorporating the Nagoya Protocol. And here uh, I also found this in, in BA to be very, very efficient system because everything can be done online or via emails and the processing time of a permit would only take 45 days, which I found to be like super less bureaucratic and super great. So another opportunity I got was like for my, I, since I did barcoding, uh, uh, the funds for the DNA barcoding was actually funded from the in-house funding of the museum, Karl and Kionik. And here are many thanks goes to my director, Bernard Mizov, and my second supervisor of my master thesis. So here, actually, I could use the semi-automated DNA extraction robotic pipeline housed at the ZFMK. Uh, so actually, uh, for the we try to barcode like around 500 specimens. And if we try to do it manually, it would have taken um, more than a month. But with the semi-auto robotic pipeline, we were able to do like it in a week. And the reason we chose for barcoding was, since there is a long knowledge gap of 75 years, when we straight away go into taxonomy, it's quite difficult because uh, since there is morphological diversity, and as I told before, like 90% of Indian millipedes were described by the Western scientists. And now they're housed in various uh, museums and the natural history museums spread across Europe. And most of the time, these are unique specimens and not available for long. So when we do taxonomy straight away, uh, it can be very, it can be time consuming uh, because we need to check the types. So here we did go for CO1 barcoding with the species delimit where the CO1 could delimit like to 70 to 80 percent accurately a species, uh, to develop a robust species hypothesis. So like kind of a, uh, giving a preliminary insight into what is actually like there, like hidden diversity there. So for my PhD, actually, I would like to continue to the other regions to explore my or expand my studies to the other regions of the Western Girls, like to unearth and describe as much as the millipede species as possible, and also to test them. I like to consider millipedes as a model taxon to test the various complex biogeographical hypotheses of the Indian subcontinent. But one of the 
problem actually I'm kind of encounter, encountering right now is like for the funds for a PhD. Since I'm already here for uh, doing my master's, I cannot apply for any international scholarships or fellowships. And if we, if I rely on a third party funding like DFG or BMBF, we need to write a proposal for six months. And this reviewing of this proposal can take more than six months. And if it's get, even it get rejected more than a year. year. And uh, another thing, since I'm done with my master's recently, right now I'm at a job searching visa, so I can legally stay in Germany only for 18 months. So I need to find something in behind in during this time. And if I completely rely on a third party funding, uh, it's quite risky. This is actually a problem uh, because only if I am because I've wanted to do on millipedes and something I'm super interested in. So if you know some kind of opportunities or some insights, I would be happy to hear after the talk. And Right now, actually, I work as a student assistant in the research group of Thomas Wiesner. He's the head and curator of uh, the Maria Poda section of the Museum Kionik, the only young leading expert on millipedes. And yeah, so with this, I would really love to end my talk and I would really love to thank Aja for reaching to us and the organizers of the Indo-German Symposium for giving me an opportunity to present my research. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you to everyone, all of our speakers, and um, perhaps most to Pooja, the future of research museums, <laughs> the, the now and the future. I have um, not received many questions in the chat. I was wondering um, whether perhaps some of the presenters would like to um, speak with one another about their um, impressions of the other presentations, because there were several uh, themes, I think, that that circumscribed many of the presentations about um, the necessity for taxonomy, the necessity for specimen study, and maybe these are things that we can consider um, with our cooperation between German and Indian research museums when we look forward um, into the next coming years. Um, I can't see at this moment any hands. Um, let me know if there are, or just start speaking. Maybe I can say something. So, um... If I had one wish what, that I could change something or um, make something easier, it would be the exchange of material between India and other nations. Because as you've seen, our taxonomic biodiversity research relies on studying specimens. And sometimes we have to study them with technology that may not be so easily available in India. So it would just be wonderful if it was slightly easier and didn't take as long to get specimens on loan, which will, of course, be returned to India once the study is finished. But that seems to be a real bottleneck for cooperations with Indian researchers in my field. Great, thank you. Somehow my uh, my field of vision has actually frozen. So um, please just speak out. I know we have um, uh, the Diga Science Center has has put some ideas in the chat. Would you um, uh, would you like to speak, Diga Science Center? We're talking about seaweeds, yes. Good evening to all of uh, you. Uh, actually, Diga Science Center, recently we conducted one uh, survey on seaweeds with the help of our one of the organization, BASI. And uh, on the basis of that, uh, some six species, uh, which is found in Diga coast, uh, we got and on the basis of that we developed on exhibition on seaweeds so my question is that okay, how we can do uh, uh, this type of documentation uh, uh, more means how can we improve it 
like uh, how science center science museum can do because some uh, can uh, means uh, how the science center can uh, enhance this type of activities we we engaged our innovation of students uh, in this uh, project also and they all are from 9 to 12 class standard thank you so much i am unable to see anyone so perhaps um dr reddy do you think that you could uh tell me who who to call on or call on them yourselves because everyone i have, uh, I have dr pratyush and uh, miss puja raise their hands maybe they can speak excellent thank you well, let me uh like uh, Dr. Gupta has asked something. So we have BSI, Botanical Survey of India and Zoological Survey of India uh, across the country. So they can collaborate with uh, BSI and ZSI for any kind of surveys and hands-on training to the students. So that, that can be taken care of. And uh, regarding uh, uh, Dr. Raz, so I, I also agree with you regarding the exchange of specimens because we desperately need some kind of like uh, initiative and it's very difficult as per the uh, laws uh, and of course nba but uh, i don't know like puja was very fortunate to get permission in a very short span of time so that's great and uh, but uh, so there can be some exchange programs in terms of like uh, and uh, we can invite uh, uh, like uh, resourceful persons to come to india and train lots of like scientists and researchers in that way so that is possible i think at the present condition so exchange or loan loaning of specimens i also inquired uh, many places so it may not be very much poss possible to uh, loan at this uh, present context i think uh, dr madhu can help us in all these things so if some uh, like government of india can take some initiatives and european museum is ready to loan specimens or like our government uh, museums, because our museums are in different ministries. So there are problems like uh, JSI or other uh, university museums are uh, under different ministries. So these kind of things are a little problematic at this point of time, but it can be facilitated, of course. Puja, you can speak. Thank you. So I have a comment, like I would like to talk to Ralph, but uh, uh, and as Pratish told, actually there is a possibility because NBA seems to be everything we could do online. And uh, there are actually different forms. I applied for form B because it was a project sanctioned by the uh, Department of Science and Technology Government of India. But there are actually form one, two, where international institutes can apply, where an in non-resident of an India can apply. And actually, uh, loading of specimens. I do not know about the museums, but uh, from the private collections or something, uh, we can apply for a permit. And it's it's very efficient, and it's clearly stated in the NBA website. If you want, I can actually email you the links. And besides that, we can actually see the statistics in the NBA website, how many proposals they have received, and uh, how many they have sanctioned it. And I also feel that NBA is very straight and less bureaucratic because they, they told me when I applied, you will get a response on the 45th day. And exactly on the 45th day, I got the uh, permit. And uh, if I want to extend the permit, I just have to send an email. If I have to extend the time for the deposition of the materials to the Indian repository, just an email is fine. It, it worked for me. And I also know a lot of colleagues of mine who works on pseudoscopy on and the CNET handbook. Uh, he, he also got the same permit. And there was another institute in Hamburg where he got uh, permits to study on, uh, to transport live spiders to study on their behavior. Like, I guess he was a postdoc. So actually, there are opportunities now. Like, India was actually very tight with their rules and regulations. But right now, they have made it, they are making it a little bit easier. Uh, at least for me, it worked, and the peer persons I know it worked for them. We just uh, and it's just like we need to have like sufficient documents, like uh, why are we doing the study? Uh, like if if there is a host, as you see, Raji Raghavan is there for you. Uh, it, if Raji, if the if your host center in India could give you a letter, things are much more easier then. It's good. Sounds great. Yeah, I can. If you provide me your email ID, I can send you the links. 
Uh, Ms. Pooja, I mean, it will help at least uh, address some of the queries which uh, Professor Lal Brits has. Now I have uh, Mr. Kumar from NCSM uh, who raised mm -hmm. his hands. Please. Yeah. Just uh, on behalf of NCSM, as DG has to leave for another meeting, uh, I think the first thing which uh, there should be, I mean, when we talk about the collaboration between oh. NCSM and Lebanese, probably we need to uh, extend this uh, uh, MOU, which was uh, has expired for that, so that we can have, we have a lot of young curators who are there, who are who want to work in such kind of research uh, uh, aspects in the museums, uh, especially with the collections. So if we can, um, how we can go about with this, uh, probably from the Lebanese Association is very important that, so that it, it gives us a framework, uh, so that maybe every year we can sponsor one or two uh, researchers from India who can uh, visit Deutsches Museum and other museums in Germany to do such kind of studies. Uh, yeah, thank you. Dr. Kachi, you want to take the question? No. Yes. I'm still having trouble seeing you, so I, I but I can hear you now, which is helpful. <laughs> I think uh, yeah. this uh, this meeting was also to get reacquainted with one another and to understand what some of um, the challenges are, but many of the opportunities. So I think this was a wonderful way to jumpstart uh, the continuation of the collaboration between. Um, our two countries and also between these two associations of museums. So uh, I'm sure that in coming weeks, we will have some opportunities to connect with one another um, in, a, in a more rolling up our sleeves and uh, getting down to, <laughs> to the MOU um, in, in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I have one question again. Yes, yes. Uh, since we are sometimes we are collecting the plant specimen also and uh, just like the herbarium seeds we made it and now we are collecting the local plant specimen of digha through our innovation hub and uh, but my question is that what kind of protocol should be uh, follow regarding displaying of different uh, kinds of botanical or zoological specimen because I know some of the zoological specimen we cannot display without any uh, some legal obligations are there. So is it uh, uh, for uh, possible to display for education purpose all the uh, collected material? And what kind of would like to take? Uh, uh, would like to answer, Mr. Kumar from NCSM. Yeah, I think this was a general question regarding the protocols. Probably again, it is connected with the the I think our arching MOU, which is there. Probably then we can go forward with that. So probably, and then we can also have a discussion with the Botanical Survey of India, and then how we can go about it, and probably we can have some understanding with them, as like we have done in um, uh, in our country, like we have done an MOU with the uh, uh, CSIR also. How we can engage uh, our two scientists together, two groups together to. Uh, display or to communicate science in a different way so that we can take it little later on. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chere, I have one question. Just rather what Mr. Kumar has told that we'll have to extend the tenure of MOU with Lebanese Association. And it is very much important in the sense that, as I have pointed out in my, you know, uh, my talk, that in science museums and science centers we encourage the visitors to touch the exhibits and all unlike you know art museum or archaeological museum so naturally you know the artifacts uh, fall prey to some damages and moreover ours is a different country um, it is hot and sultry at certain places especially in the coastal areas so i think that we should have a long term uh, collaboration with our German counterparts in educating us how to handle and how to conserve uh, the, the, the artifacts we generally keep in our science park because you know having the concept of science park is our forte because the, for the first time in the world we introduced that one so that is a very you know essential area I look forward to
I, I have, I'm he hearing various points that we can uh, discuss in the in the memorandum of understanding when we have those talks, um, and conservation would be one of them. I think. Um, all of these points are bilateral points because, of course, um, Germany is not known for its hot and sultry climate. So maybe you have some techniques <laughs> that you can help us with um, and the other way around. So um, so I think what would be great is be, maybe collect some of these ideas for what, um, what the desired um, sub points would be um, to put in, in a future memorandum, and then we can negotiate and talk about um, how, how this memorandum might be formed and, and what points it would contain. And if, um, if you would like to address me um, through that, that would be, that would be fine. Uh, we can, I will also work with Dr. Reddy on, uh, on how how we're going to put together um, the nuts and bolts of of this conversation around the memorandum? I have one question. So what yeah. I would suggest is, since uh, uh, from NSCM all the queries can be uh, uh, collated, and NSCM can be National Council for Science Museum could be the nodal agency from India, and uh, like Leibniz, uh, you are the nodal agency from Leibniz. Then they can cooperate. If there's anything which needs facilitation from our side, we'll be very happy. There is one question from Ms. Uh, Sadhana. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, my question is that uh, in a Vishwasha Museum, we have the stationary steam engine. And I had seen a similar steam engine during my visit to the Daoshis Museum in Munich. So whether we can exchange information about this particular uh, uh, collection, between the two museums so that information which we we have can be shared with you and which you have can be shared with us and we can learn from each other similar machine i rem remember in one of my photographs also i found so whether it's possible to exchange information about some of the collection absolutely i mean i think that 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 is always a possibility and if uh, the question is how to how to find the person with whom to exchange this information um I'm going to put my uh, my contact information in the chat, and I am uh, I would be the person to come to, and then I will distribute uh, the information to the people who might not be immediately apparent through our websites, etc. So, if any of you have questions about the collections, about specific um, objects, about policies about any parts of the Leibniz Research Museums, please uh, contact me. And if I'm not able to answer your question or point you to the right person, I will figure out someone who can. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, there are no more questions. I think uh, we can uh, end this uh, uh, session. We had a very nice session. Uh, uh, is there anything uh, would you like to add, Dr. Katya? I am so happy to have been part of this, uh, and I think it's going to open up a very new world for all of our researchers, hopefully uh, not just in science and technology, but we also have many uh, culturally specific and cultural research museums. And if you can connect with your colleagues to connect us with them, that would be wonderful as well. And I hope um, that we will also see some of you, many of you at the Global Summit of Research Museums in uh, in October. I will also, um, if, you, if you contact me, I'm putting my uh, information in the chat. Uh, please ask me any questions, uh, including about the Global Summit. Thank you so much. Uh, for having me at this wonderful event. Yeah, so thank you. So I would like to formally uh, thank, uh, give a vote of thanks. I would like to thank His Excellency Ambassador uh, Bharatanini Harish, uh, Dr. Vashni, uh, Shri Choudhury, Dr. General NCSM, uh, Shri uh, Kumar, Director Headquarters NCSM, uh, Mr. Uh, Subrata Choudhury, Director Nish uh, Nehru Science Center, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sadhana, Director of Vishweshwara Industrial and Technical Museum, Bangalore. And from the gentleman side, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, uh, Alexander Bush, Director General of Romanish Germanish uh, Central Museum Mines, uh, Professor Helmut Trischler, 
Professor Bernard Vishoff, uh, Professor uh, Clement Talkner, uh, Dr. Janvi Falki from Bangalore, Dr. Deepak Pirapan, Dr. Pachish Mahapatra, uh, uh, Ms. Pooja Anil Kumar, Dr. Ralph Briggs, Dr. Raju Raghavan, and last but not the least, Dr. Katya, uh, for making this event happen. And thank you very much for all of you uh, for having joined this uh, meeting. And uh, what I would do is I'll request all of you to uh, to open the video, start your camera so that we can take one uh, uh, screenshot of the photograph. If you can please uh, uh, start, I mean, uh, start your video cam so that we can capture one uh, screenshot. Everybody, those, all of you can uh, open. Okay, anyone else? Uh, I still see some of the cameras still off. Like Dilip Ghosh, Krishnindu Chaudhary, Kanisha Chakravarti, Gautam Seel. They can just open, yeah, start your video cams. I'll. Uh... Can I take a screenshot? Yeah, cheese. Just hold on, I'll take a couple of them so that. Uh... One more. There's a second uh, sheet also there. I see a lot of people. One more time, please. So thank you very much uh, uh, for your time and for attending this uh, meeting. And as I said, no, I mean, Dr. Katya and NCSM, Dr. Kumar will be the uh, points from India and Germany for, for uh, including any memoranda of understanding and other issues. I uh, thank you once again from Embassy of India uh, for your time. Have a great day ahead. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Embassy of India in Berlin. Yeah, thank you.